31, I'm sorry, <laughs> one minute late. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the, the, the roundtable discussion for the Meet the Candidates. I know in some minds it may be a little late, but again, the real voting is on Saturday the 10th. So if you haven't voted yet, you still have a chance. Um, and please come out and vote on Saturday the 10th. That's going to be at the, the Van Alstine Public Library. Um, hours are seven to seven, yeah. Seven in the morning to seven in the evening. So uh, hopefully you can find a time to come out and vote. <clears throat> in the meantime, we have rescheduled this uh, round table discussion. And thank you all for, for, for doing so, it's, it's much appreciated. Um, before we get started, and although this election is not about me whatsoever, I uh, had received some questions uh, inquiring about who I am exactly. So, oh. Oh. yeah, I know, and and, and, and perhaps I, I mispronounced Van Alstine, but and things like that. <laughs> oh, but, oh. Well, okay. Well, let, let me just say, uh, give you a little background about myself. Uh, originally, I'm from Plano. I am a North Texas gal. Hmm. Is that funny? <laughs> People have told me that all my life, and I, I don't know why. Uh, my father was from East Texas, my mother was from Missouri, but I grew up in Plano. And, and by growing up in Plano, I watched Plano grow. Uh, I was born in 68. In 1972, I was collecting uh, cans, aluminum cans and, and bottles at the construction sites in what is now Middle Plano, which at that point was West Plano, and, and for money. And I'd take them to the local Safeway to get money. Point is, I watched Plano grow, and now it's, it's very difficult for me to recognize it. Um, and, and I had that same feeling on a smaller scale for Van Alstine. And, and being the president of the Chamber of Commerce, I want to make sure that we grow not quite as big as Plano, but in the same, well, really, in the same vein as Plano, productively, uh, uh, conjunctively, together. And that is my main goal for having this roundtable discussion. Um, um, that was really what I wanted to say about my background, other than, yes, I am the president of the, the, the Chamber of Commerce, and my only goal is to pr promote this city, and be it through activities, events, the city council, promoting the, the candidates. I want to do that, because that is, that is the, the goal of not only the Chamber of Commerce, but the, the entire city, to come together, to work together, to, to promote the Van Alstine, because we are on the cross <coughs> of growing just as Plano was when I was four years old. Another question, and, and, and I'm not going to be labeled a clown like some people have called me, but another question is how old am I? Just to quell your curiosity, I'm 45 years old. I will be 46 this year, okay? I look younger than I am, I know. Um, that's only because I've been blessed, I suppose. Uh, but in any case, this election is not about me nor the chamber. This is about promoting Van Alstine and it growing, uh, be it through uh, businesses, through politics, through cohesion. These are very important topics that I think we need to discuss tonight. Um, getting my notes now. Uh, oh, another thing I wanted to mention, which of course, may label me as a clown, but it's 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 more my philosophy of things. Um, I am actually wearing a daughter of my ja uh, a, a jacket of my daughter, a shirt of my husband, oh. and of course, my own pants, because that's the way I, I think of things. My family is a, a unit. We are a group. I probably have dog hair on my clothes as well. <laughs> but, but that's, I like to do that because it, 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 it's a warm feeling for me, especially when I'm speaking to a number of people and I'm having to answer questions. But the point is, I, I like to say, think of myself as, as a member of a group, and that group is my family. And now my family is Van Alstine. 
And I, I think all of us feel the same way. And, and that's why we need to come together and have more of a discussion as opposed to, you know, the, the infighting and things like that. That's the whole idea behind this. Now, I am not a, a, a teacher, but I would like for all of us to consider this, this gathering as a classroom, not a, a courtroom or anything like that, but a classroom where we can discuss a book, a book which is called Life in Van Alstein. Van Alstein. Van Alstein. Life here. <laughs> no, but, but, but this is something that pertains to all of us, and we all have concerns, we all have issues, we all have desires and ideas, and, and the point of this, this whole roundtable is that we can come together and discuss them, not one person badgering another, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, like I said, think of it as a classroom where we learn. Um, and uh, along the same lines, don't speak out of turn. Sorry. Just, okay. Uh, what we have, you all have your, your topic sheets. There are five topics. They were chosen from 30 submitted questions. Uh, they were, the questions were then, I guess, categorized into three different, uh, five different topics. Um, Along those topic lines, there are also keywords from specific questions, which all the candidates have been given. Uh, keywords meaning, uh, for example, regarding cohesion, uh, various ent entities and organizations in the city, and how we can work together um, with those various entities and organizations. So the candidates have five different topics and some keywords. You all have only the topics. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce a topic and have the candidates speak their own mind about these topics and hopefully include the keywords. And each candidate will have three to four minutes to discuss this, their point of view about a certain topic. Uh, afterwards, we will have open uh, questioning from the audience, up to maybe three questions, limited to one minute uh, questions or comments from the audience uh, for the three, I mean, three people, one minute each, and then rebuttal or comment from the candidates. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Uh, the point being, let the candidates speak first, let the candidates say what they need to say about each topic, and then the audience will have a chance to, to, to comment and, and or question, and then they can, they can comment as well following the audience questions. I would like to keep it to maybe 30 minutes per topic, if possible, just for the sake of time, but you know, we, we'll go with the flow. Some topics may take longer than others, some obviously not so long. Uh, but if that's okay with everyone, we'll just kind of go with the flow. Um, and I do request everyone be polite, passionate but polite. Uh, let's, one, of, one of the big issues with the questions uh, for the, the candidates was behavior in the meetings. So let's kind of keep ourselves in check. Remember, it's a classroom, okay? If, if that's okay. I'm, again, I'm not the teacher. I'm the facilitator. Um, so, along those lines, let's go ahead and start with the opening topic, which is cohesion. And uh, regarding cohesion, there are many entities and bodies and citizens in the city of Van Alstine. Alstine. And all seeds. All seeds. But there are two. But no, 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 no,
um, is, is apparently a very important issue. Most of the questions pertain to that. So uh, regarding cohesion, I'm just going to throw out on a general level, and, and candidates, if you, if you have something to say, uh, some input, please feel free. Um, is there a, a vision, maybe? I'm just going to start this with a broad question. In your mind, where all the, the citizens, the entities, the organizations, the city government, etc., can come together, and how, how would that happen? to further propel Van Alstein into a successful city. Mr. Cooper. Well, it is one city. Now, right now, there, there's, a, there's a name for a subdivision down south called Georgetown, um, but it's part of Van Alstein. Um, now, there, there are other subdivisions around, though they don't have names like Georgetown, but there are subdivisions. And, and Van Alstein is going to grow population-wise. And it's not going to be long before we have many subdivisions. Um, sometimes, um, now I've heard a rumor, though I don't get much sense of it walking around door to door, but I've, I heard that there was a big division between uh, Van Alstein proper, you know, the middle of the city, and Georgetown. I, I don't really find that to be so. I don't, people, I, I don't find people talking about Georgetown as if they were a, a, a separate entity, another little, little city down there. Um, I, think, I think folks are getting used to the idea of, of, of subdivisions, and I think there are going to be more of them. Um, now, and as we get more subdivisions, as Van Alstine gets more subdivisions, um, then there's going to be higher population, too. Um, it's, it's possible, this is a little off topic, but um, it, we may be moving to a different form of local government, um, home rule, before too long. I mean, I, I can see that within the next within the next decade, for sure. Um, and, and, and people are going to come together. Um, this, is a, this is a city, um, and its center is going to be what is Van Alstein property <coughs> right now. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay quaint. We can develop that, um, that uh, city center, uh, the town square, um, and, uh, and, and make it nice, and make it a good place to come and visit and walk around. Um, and and uh, all these subdivisions, they're all, they're all going to become part of Van Alstine. And I hope that answers the question. Mr. Smith? Um, I've been here for six years in July. I moved to Van Alstine because it was, to me, and I've made the comment over and over to customers that come in the restaurant, that are here looking for lands of 20 acres and they, they want to get away from Dallas and, and want to get away from the big cities and the rat race. And I talk to people about how this is like living in Mayberry. And it does have that. It has that atmosphere. Um, there are times when I, if I need to go to the post office or the bank or the grocery store, or go next door and drink coffee at the drugstore, I don't bother locking my door. Uh, if somebody's looking for me, they know to either sit and wait, which has <laughs> happened several times, or to look for me at the drugstore drink the coffee. Uh, that, that's, that's the atmosphere that I want to have. Um, there is, when I first moved here, it didn't take long to sense that there was a, a factions of Van Alstine. Uh, the first one that I noticed was and, and whether it's good or bad, uh, it creates, uh, it may create commerce. There was a Marshall Street mentality and then there was a Jefferson Street. There was competitiveness between the two. Um, and we talked about the square in Van Alstine. We don't have a square. We have the reverse of a square. And in a square, you can see, if this was a square, I can see all the businesses there. There is a unity that is in place when you when you have a square, even though there might be a, an obstacle in the middle where you can't exclusively see everything. But there's that mentality of a square where people work together and they're friends and they and they depend on each other. They buy from each other. That's that's what we don't have. We have we have we don't have a square. We have the reverse of one. 
and and that's what I've seen since I've been here. Um, the the cohesion that that you talk about, and this is the number one topic. I've seen cohesion to a fault with the city of Van Alstine. When I can, when I went to council member meetings before I started here, we had everybody agree. And in my opinion, from the, the time that I've spent going to council meetings, uh, the, uh, the commissioners meetings, hospital board meetings, school board meetings, there should be discussion. Not everybody should agree about every single thing that, that is presented to them. I saw cohesion where everybody, the city manager would reach over and do this and everybody was sitting there going, yeah, that's cohesion. It's not a good kind, but it is cohesion. I have noticed, in, the, in my opinion, in the last couple of years, when we have a council meeting, we are not presented with adequate information to make decisions. City staff and the city manager should present definitive answers for us, and we don't have that right now. We as a council are compelled to each one of us contribute our opinion on a topic. There should be more discussion and more homework done, if you will, by city staff before they present it to the council. Water rates is a, is a perfect example. I mentioned several times, I don't know how to create a water rate system for a, a municipality. I don't have that expertise. I can create a menu for a restaurant and I factor in the cost and, and the, the, the amount of money that we expect to make as a net profit and the operating cost, I can do that, but I'm not equipped to do that. And I don't think there's any council member that we have currently that can single-handedly create that, that information. It has to be done by people that are professional, that are trained, that are experienced in doing that. To ask five lay people to do something that they have no background in is, is a fault. And I can go on if you want me to. <laughs> no, actually, uh, that's okay. Uh, you actually uh, were talking, uh, you covered some issues on topic number five, but that's <clears throat> that's good. But a segue, Timberly? Yes, I said cohesion. Yes, I'll try to stay with cohesion. Um, um, I moved to Van Alstine for two reasons. One is because it was a small town, it has that small town feel. And I love what um, you said about your family being a cohesive unit. I believe that when I moved to the small town, for having come from the city, I worked in Addison, I came from a big city in Colorado Springs, that Van Alstine would give me the ability to get to know my neighbors, to have my son paid attention to, because he was going to be a freshman in high school, and he did go to Van Alstine High School, and absolutely, that was the other reason I came here, was so that he could get a really good education in a small town environment and get some uh, care and attention. And so I really feel that the small town atmosphere is important to maintain, but I see the growth coming. The challenge for us is going to be to be to pull together and maintain that small town feeling amongst each other while we grow, because the growth is coming. It's, it's going to affect us. And I'm hoping that as it comes that we don't um, lose some of the cohesiveness that we have had. I've heard wonderful stories as I've talked to individuals that were raised here and who've lived here a long time about how vibrant the city center has been in the past. They have incredible memories about, you know, Van Alstine and all of the wonderful things that happened um, from parades to community events. We still do things like the 4th of July. I love the fall to all. I think that the more community events that we do together, the more that we get our families out with each other, the more that we can maintain and encourage each other to accept differences maybe that we have here. But I think the lines, you know, I hope the lines can blur between who's lived here all their life and who's new. Because I love the city as much as anybody does and I plan to be buried in the cemetery, God willing, um, you know, with a, with a lot of the rest of you all. 
Um, I think it's a wonderful community. I think that it has pulled together, it can pull together, and I, I don't see that we have a humongous issue. Um, rumors I've heard, you know, Larry is right, rumors I've heard as I've walked and talked with people, long time then all seniors or people that are raised here, I don't hear those kinds of rumors come out of their mouth. They seem very accepting of me, very loving, very caring, uh, opened up their hearts to me and shared you know, their stories, like I said, and opened up their doors and said, come on in and set a spell, and that is what I love about this city. So that's kind of, I, I don't know what we can do as far as town hall meetings with the full council. You know, we ran to get up against the Open Meetings Act issue, uh, but I really think that governmental town hall uh, meetings are phenomenal. Uh, if we have to take turns heading them or something, we've got to hear from the citizens. We, you know, I've loved going door to door. I've literally walked every single street, knocked on every single door. If you weren't there, my apologies, but we've tried. And um, done a couple of neighborhoods a couple of times, trying to catch people at various times of day. But as we've done that, um, we, you know, hear about issues, but you can't continue to do door to door, door to door all the time. So there's got to be a way where we can pull people together and talk, maybe neighborhood to neighborhood or something, uh, where we find out what are people concerned about, you know, what, how do we resolve some of these issues. Um, there are things city council is not going to be um, astute on. There are other issues that maybe some of our backgrounds uh, can bring some knowledge and some um, uh, understanding of issues to citizens. So I think we have to work on that, but I would love to see us do town hall meetings and bring the government literally to the people, if that's a possibility. So that's what I'm thinking about the meeting. Well, I've lived here uh, 24 plus years. And when I moved here, it was neighbor talking to neighbor. You know, for, uh, there, was, you know, for, uh, there was handshakes, friendliness, and doing things together. And uh, that's what I like about Van Alstein, and that's what I have experienced um, as people move in from bigger cities. You know, there, there seems to be a difference of thought in spending and uh, regulations and ordinances that I just am opposed to. I think it's important that we have a uh, keeping, you know, spending within our, uh, within uh, some sort of reign that uh, it's not, we don't need everything today right now, but that we plan some of these things and work them out over periods of time. And uh, as far as uh, the cohesiveness on the, uh, as Jim was saying, uh, with everyone agreeing, I saw something similar. I saw four people agreeing and one person having a diff, being able to express other opinions and ideas. And that's one of the reasons why I ran for council and would like to continue on because I think that we do have an opportunity to see some changes. Uh, made uh, in the way the city is governed. Thank you. And, and Mr. Jasko. Uh, yes, on the, on the, uh, the cohesion, uh, focusing on the uh, ability of the, uh, the, the city, the entities, the organizations, uh, the citizens uh, working together. Uh, I've been here uh, almost seven years, but I uh, grew up and, and graduated high school from Tom Bean, which is smaller than Van Alstein. Uh, we competed with Van Alstein. Uh, Van Alstein, uh, when I was there, was a lot more dominant. <laughs> um, Tom Bean's come a long way, but so has so has Van Alstein. Uh, my job uh, opportunity is what brought me to Van Alstein uh, to work, and uh, my family and I uh, looked at the surrounding towns, whether or not to live in Van Alstein, or Howe, or Tom Bean, or Wyrat, wherever. And Van Alstein, to me, uh, seemed like it had the most to offer. Uh, there was uh, 
already established a, a nice uh, downtown area. Uh, you had the local shops. Uh, the people we visited with were very friendly. Uh, there is a uh, uh, really a sense of character here and all the components that everybody talks about as far as the different uh, being the, the people that have been here forever and the people that are moving in and the different types of uh, businesses and the school and uh, everything all contribute to the character of the town. And I think Van Alton is blessed that we have all these different different things. Uh, we also have an opportunity and everyone talks about the growth. Uh, Van Alstein can grow into even uh, a better community. Um, that's that's what drew me here. Uh, you know, our proximity here on the highway, we're exactly halfway between uh, two larger cities. Uh, you know, as, as we grow, I mean, we can see what happened, you know, between Dallas and, and McKinney. You know, there was Plano, there's Richardson, there's Allen. It's all kind of grown together. But uh, each of those towns, you know, you still know which town you're in when you're coming through it. And I feel like Van Alstine can grow in that same manner. And we can do that by all working together. We keep the character of Van Alstine so that everybody knows we're coming through Van Alstine uh, when we get here. Our, uh, our growth, uh, you know, so we're talking about uh, attracting, you know, possibly light manufacturing industry, stuff like that. Uh, I would think that uh, we also need a little more retail. We uh, uh, have excellent layout as far as residential. Uh, all of those are going to contribute to uh, a the the strength in, in Van Alstine's financial condition because growth brings more revenue from a tax standpoint. Uh, the key is for us to have the people in place that will be able to manage that growth and we also need, most importantly, to make sure that every one of the citizens are on, on board with what we're doing because the citizens are the ones that are going to have a, a direct effect you know the people coming in are going to have to uh, get along they're not going to take over you know Van Alstine is Van Alstine and uh, if we're all working together uh, between the city the chamber uh, keep Van Alstine beautiful the library Every entity that we've got here has an important role in this community, and we all need to be on the same page as what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. Uh, that's where I think the cohesion comes in. Yes, everybody's entitled to their opinion, and yes, those opinions differ, but I think I've said before that everybody has the goodness, the, the, the intention of doing good for Van Alstine, and that's what we need to work together towards. Very good comments from, from all of you. Um, however, uh, there were some questions submitted, and I did promise to address those. So along the lines of cohesion, I'm going to throw out a couple of uh, questions, that, topics that were not addressed uh, necessarily. Uh, one of them was, um, if you prefer to have a, a, an open forum, kind of like we're having now, versus a, a, a strict meeting. Uh, how would you do that? And if there are unanswered questions at any forum or meeting, how would you follow up? And, and there were some concerns about a suggestion box being placed at City Hall as opposed to somewhere not so intimidating. So let's talk about that sort of thing. Uh, Robert, since you were on a roll, I'm going to pass it right back to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, I've been attending the uh, uh, city council meetings for a number of years. Um, I've been involved in, in the different uh, uh, organizations uh, and entities. 
um, the the city meetings uh, there I think that in the council meetings uh, Jim made a good point about uh, the council being informed uh, more but um, I also feel that and this goes against the way that it's set up I believe that citizens should have a right to speak during the meeting and I don't mean somebody that you know sit there and shout an outburst and you know contradictory to you know whoever's saying that kind of thing but I believe that as a you know I believe that the, that the citizens should have something to say yes that's going to make the meeting a little bit longer but if you limit the time to where you know they could ask a question uh, and have a rebuttal answer like you know like we're doing here I think that would be constructive um, to call that a shot I don't know if that's a council if that's the mayor if that's the city manager I think everybody should have an input in that we should come to some kind of a uh, an arrangement uh, to do that as far as a, uh, a suggestion box uh, maybe we can have several suggestion boxes around town to where uh, uh, where people feel comfortable if they feel comfortable at McDonald's or at the quick check or at the bank or at the uh, you know any, anywhere in town uh, have, have suggestion boxes there and uh, uh, you know we can act on it that way I mean if, that, if that's going to if, if, if City Hall is too intimidating we can you know change that to uh, you know maybe have it at the at the CDC EDC office uh, I know uh, Christy and Anita are very friendly uh, I wouldn't think that they could they would be intimidating so, uh, some of the nicest ladies I've ever met uh, okay thank you Robert uh, Karen thoughts on that thoughts on that I think we've made some a uh, few changes recently like with the mayor's letter that's coming out now as a way of informing the people uh, another thing that was budgeted for but was not followed through on was the uh, the last the 83rd legislative session passed the regulation that we can now have a an electronic message board and that would be where the council members could speak and the public could observe and see what it is and it does not violate then the Open Meetings Act and I've encouraged that but nothing has been done on it so I would like to pursue that that we have the electronic message board so that there can be some open discussion before the council meetings there's uh, when I first uh, got on council I went and looked at the, uh, the growth plan 20-year plan like they told me they had to blow the dust off of it because no one had touched it for the last 10 years it was from 03 to 13 and uh, and it goes to uh, 2023 uh, I was suggesting that we have all the different organizations because they started out with a meeting once with uh, the different heads of departments and departments briefing the people uh, and this was over at one of the banks and uh, it was an opportunity for the uh, people to see meet some of the people working in the city and also to see what they're doing and uh, they would talk about what each department did I think something like that is very informative and it was helpful but it was a one-time deal and it was dropped uh, never done again this way if we would include the people we would have a chance for an interchange and exchange it wasn't just briefing but you could find out different things what the people were doing so uh, getting back to the 20-year plan my thought was that we get all the different organizations together and see what we want to do with Van Austin where do we want to go let's have some open discussion for the different things to see where our growth is going to be what what the people how the people want to see it grow which way and what and these are some of the things that I would encourage and I would like to see done 
Okay, very good. Uh, Kimberly. Yes, and um, as far as the town hall meeting, I mentioned that I really feel like we need to get the government to the people and vice versa. I think there has to be some kind of interchange and again, um, without violating the Open Meetings Act, I know that we can do official city town hall meetings because we did it with the water issue. And I was very glad that we did that. And people have the opportunity at that type of meeting to just, you know, share their questions, share their comments. Um, we had a committee that came out of that because as people talked, uh, it, it, it was apparent who really understood the issues. And so we could pull from the citizens and their expertise to help the council to make that decision. That was great. Uh, I think the library and the post office would be great places. I also thought the EDC and CDC um, uh, office would be a great place to have a drop box for people to put their questions. Uh, I think that Karen's idea of the electronic message board and using something that the state has actually said, it's okay, this doesn't violate the Open Meetings Act, that's an awesome idea. I would love to see us do that. So, you know, I think that one of the best things, though, is that official town hall meeting. When you get a bunch of individuals together, something happens. There's a synergy amongst us, and we begin to pull off of each other, you know, and out of each other. Um, the knowledge that's shared and the, the ideology and some of the conflict goes away when we see that we really are thinking very similarly, and we can pull from the expertise within the community. So if we could head that direction, I think that would be the best. Okay, Mr. Cooper or Jim, either one. Um, well, I, I'd like to draw a distinction, I think, between um, city council meetings and town hall meetings. And I think uh, I like Mr. Jaska's uh, idea of, of people being able to, uh, to speak up during a, a city council meeting, um, speak their mind. I also think that, that uh, a town hall meeting might be useful. And realizing that, that there's a concern there that, that uh, once again we're going to run into that quorum issue where we have a bunch of city councilmen here that create a quorum and city council members might not be able to, uh, well we can't really deliberate, we can't really answer questions, but we can certainly listen to questions, we can listen to concerns, write them down and be ready to go to work on them. Uh, many of the concerns that, that could come out in a town hall meeting could be placed on an agenda. Um, and I, I like the idea of the uh, suggestion boxes in, in places where uh, that, that are prominent, places where a lot of people, where there's a lot of traffic. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I see a question here, unanswered questions, strategy for follow-up. And I see no reason why uh, city council members <coughs> um, uh, working with department heads especially can't, uh, can't do some homework um, and, uh, and, and be prepared to answer questions. If they don't have the answers right away, then then they can get them, and those are things that can be addressed um, at city council meetings. Um, um, Robert's right, there's all sorts of rules that we have to follow. Uh, and those of us that have been elected, and lucky enough or unfortunate enough to be elected, have to follow those rules. There are guidelines. Um, I, I agree that, that we need citizens need to be able to speak at city council meetings. There is a time issue. Um, three minutes at the beginning of every every council meeting, there's an there's a, a item on the agenda that gives everybody three minutes. Um, some people take 10, but uh, that's all monitored by the, by the, the uh, mayor. And that's a great place to voice your opinion. And, and to, to get your thoughts known and to get your opinions out there. But we as a council cannot interact with that person that's making that three minute or 10 minute presentation. We, we sit quietly and absorb that information just like we would in a town hall meeting because if there was an agenda, we can't, we can't communicate back and forth. That's, that's part of the that's part of the rules you have to follow. Town hall meetings are great. I have town hall meetings in my restaurant all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes this table will be, we'll move over to this table and, and uh, we'll increase the size of the town hall meeting. And uh, if I have time, I'll sit and moderate or, or become involved or lead or whatever you want to call it. Uh, town hall meetings are great. It's communicating with your citizens that is the ultimate thing. Uh, being able to do that at a 
council meeting would be time consuming and it would take the discipline of the mayor to be able to, to keep those down to three minutes and the fact that we sit there with no way to communicate back. A citizen can come in and say whatever they want, good or bad, and, and we sit there and accept that we're being accused of being thieves and robbers and criminals and that sort of thing. So uh, the town hall might might be a way to uh, to communicate, but there's rules you have to follow. Uh, elected officials Okay, have to well, be right here tonight, those rules don't apply. So I'm going to ask the audience, does anyone have a question for, for the candidates? Uh, along the lines of cohesion, which is what we were talking about. I have is, a question. Yes, Mr. Curry. Suggestion box. Yeah. How does it get answered? Okay. I mean, it's great you've got these suggestion boxes. Yeah, that was one of the that was, questions in. Yeah, the follow-up is important. Is it going to be through email? Most likely. Um, I, if, I'm not if, sure how that would be. If I may, um, I would prefer to have an email to to an address of, of a person, an entity, whatever, because you have to sign it. You have to identify yourself. It's not just those those rocks being thrown in the dark. So it basically, you're talking about just strictly email exchanges. Well, as as a form. A as a form. Now, my experience and, and what I I have seen in lots of different towns, and it's not just because this is a chamber event. To me, the chamber is the hub of the town, should always be the hub. Now, if you get into little towns in Texas, the Dairy Queen's the hub, <laughs> because that's where all the information can either be gathered or, or, or given out. The city should be a spoke of that. <coughs> the school should be. The EDC and the CDC, keep Van Alstein beautiful are all spokes of that wheel, but the chamber is the hub. In my opinion, Paul, that's where that's where you could you could have as a central location. The, the, the chamber should be the hub of the town. Because it's it's non political, non denominational. It is the it, the entity that should be as neutral as any any entity that it that, that exists in the community. That that's would be my suggestion that the chamber run that that or that program okay well just if i can put my own 10 cents in one of the uh, we we have a suggestion box on our website and you can submit suggestions anonymously uh, would that be something well, for those who have emails but there are quite a few in town who do not use email right. right okay so there would have to be another option Right. Okay. Well, yeah, always more than one. Any other questions on cohesiveness? Well, I just wonder why uh, you said anonymously. Well, they don't have to. They don't have to put their names and when they submit a suggestion or a question. If they do, uh, we make sure and follow up within 24 hours. The chamber does. In other words. So there's no reason not to have a name or telephone number. True. Absolutely. Otherwise, their suggestion or whatever is not going to get. Oh, I agree. I agree. But, but sometimes they don't. They just want to say, "Hey, maybe you should do this," and then right. you don't know where to go after that. But you do. I do listen to it, and, and the chamber board listens to their their suggestions, recommendations, uh, etc. And if it's a question, I will address it maybe in the the, the newsletter. But I'm not running for office. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Cooper. Well, some suggestions might be anonymous, and, and, and it won't matter. I mean, if, if there's someone that says um, that I've got a, a dilapidated house, catty corner from me, at, or at such and such an address, then that may be something. If, if they even if they don't sign it, uh, put an email address on it. That's something that, that a, a council member can go out and take a look at, and see how bad it is. I mean, if it's a, uh, a an attractive nuisance for kids, um, and uh, and no one's taking care of it at all, yeah. they might need to come down. And, and we might not know about it um, without that suggestion. Sure. Without sure. Like the Thanks. One, somebody mentioned the way the city is governed might change in the future. 
I'd like some explanation. Well, we may, we probably will get to that at, at topic number five, okay. uh, if you don't mind, sir. I'd like to keep the, the, the questions uh, pertinent then, to the topic then, in here. Then uh, one a very direct one. Okay. I started work when the mimeograph machine was great. The world is an electronic <laughs> message board. <Yeah. laughs> I don't know. Big question. Uh, uh, anyone yeah. familiar with Facebook? Nope. Can, can someone answer that question? Because I'm not on Facebook. I'm really kind of better on Facebook. Karen, do you know? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was proposed by uh, Representative Dan Branch. And uh, his uh, idea and what was accepted by the 83rd legislative session was that uh, you can have, now there, there are different kinds of electronic message boards. One would be on the website of the city, the city website, where uh, information can be put on there or a discussion about uh, you know, the water rate uh, and then the different council members can talk back and forth. The citizens could not uh, communicate with us directly on that, but they could see the interaction between the council members. Now you can talk one-on-one -on -one with the council member. My phone rings constantly and uh, or frequently, and, and I get emails as well. So I'm very open, and the citizens uh, feel free to contact me about things, which I relay then on to either the city manager or the appropriate person. Right. So uh, that's a one-on-one, -on -one. but the electronic message board is strictly for the council members to uh, discuss different items and then have it available for the citizens to see so that it is, and no action can be taken. It's right. just discussion. This is not can I clarify a little bit? Excuse me. I, I'm sorry, are you finished? I just the I think you're asking you're asking us exactly what is it, and and it is usually on a website, and there are boxes where if you if there's a place for you to write an opinion yourself if you want to go and give ask some some question, you can actually go into that <coughs> place on the website and type in your question, and then you can click send or whatever, and others can see it. And in the same way, the city council members and such that that have access on a website with an opportunity and place to be able to write in what they're wanting to say. <coughs> Is it like a chat room? It, uh, it's a little bit different. It's, it, if you know any, if you've seen Facebook at all, you've probably seen it on at least TV. No. Nope. Okay, but but anyway, it's uh, that's really. What it is on the internet is just a place where you can go in and type what you want to type for someone else to see it. You can write a message and send it to somebody else. So the city council would set up a page like that for... Now, there's also another kind of electronic message board that I've investigated as well, and that is strictly electronic, and it would be kept at City Hall and... Uh, council members can input things and then the people, the citizens can go to City Hall and read what is being discussed. It's uh, real time. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay, but it's real time. And that's the other type of electronic message board that is available. And uh, we, okay, like I said, we budget this. I'm going to hold that thought, but there, there, Mr. Patterson, isn't it? Yeah. All right. He had one question, then we're going to go uh, right yeah, back to that. One question. Uh, Karen kind of hit on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about at least 25% of this city don't have the emails, the Facebook, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, we're going to be left out of everything? That's, that's what's wrong yeah. now. That's where the me uh, mechanical one, the, ele uh, the actual mm -hmm. uh, me electronically run message thing, like that there are different options. Like a, a drop box, you mean? Like the suggestion box? No, 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 no. It's... <laughs> Yeah. No, you, you, Mr. Patterson was asking about those who do not have email yeah, and not right. have access to that. Um, do we have a Teddy Ann? Teddy Ann, yes, Madam Mayor. There's a couple of things I'd like to clear up. Yes, ma'am. Clarification. One is the fact that when you come to a council meeting, if there is something on the agenda that you wish to talk about, 
to the council. When you fill out a form, that's <laughs> I have a question. Uh, anyone familiar with Facebook? No. Can someone answer that question? Because I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. Karen, you know? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it was proposed by uh, Representative Dan Branch. And uh, his uh, idea and what was accepted by the 83rd legislative session was that uh, you can have, now that there are different kinds of electronic message boards. One would be on the website of the city, the city website, where uh, information can be put on there or a discussion about, uh, you know, the water rate, uh, and then the different council members can talk back and forth. The citizens could not uh, communicate with us directly on that, but they could see the interaction between the council members. Now you can talk one on one with the council member. My phone rings constantly and uh, or frequently, and and I get emails as well. So I'm very open, and the citizens uh, feel free to contact me about things, which I relay then on to either the city manager or the appropriate person. So uh, that's a one on one. But the electronic message board is strictly for the council members to uh, discuss different items and then have it available for the citizens to see so that it is, and no action can be taken. It's right. just discussion. This is not can finish. I clarify a little bit? Excuse me. I, I'm sorry, are you finished? I just, the, I think you're asking, you're asking is exactly what is it? And, and it is usually on a website. And there are boxes where if you, if there's a place for you to write an opinion yourself, if you want to go and give, ask, some, some question, you can actually go into that little <coughs> place on the website and type in your question. And then you can click send or whatever and others can see it. And in the same way, the city council members and such as that have access on a website with an opportunity and place to be able to write in what they're wanting to say. <coughs> Is it like a chat right? It, uh, it's a little bit different. It's, it, if you know any, if you've seen Facebook at all, you've probably seen it on at List TV. Where, okay, but but anyway, it's uh, that's really what it is on the internet. It's just a place where you can go in and type what you want to type for someone else to see it. You can write a message and send it to somebody else. So the city council would set up a page like that for. Now, there's also another kind of electronic message board that I've investigated as well, and that is strictly electronic, and it would be kept at City Hall, and uh, council members could input things, and then the people, the citizens can go to City Hall and read what is being discussed. It's uh, real time. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay, but it's real time, and that's the other type of electronic message board that is available. and. Uh, we, but okay, like that's, we that's good. I'm going to hold that thought, but they're, they're Mr. Patterson, isn't it? Yeah. All right. right. They get one question. Uh, yeah, right I got one there. question. Uh, Karen kind of hit on it a little bit. But what are we going to do about at least 25% of this city don't have the emails, the Facebook, and all that kind of stuff? Yes. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, we're going to be left out of everything? But that's that's wrong yeah. now. That's where the me uh, mechanical that's one, the, ele uh, the actual. Uh, electronically run message thing. Like I said, there are different options like available. The drop box, you mean? Like the suggestion box? No, 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 no. It's... <laughs> no, you, you, Mr. Patterson was asking about those who do not have email no, and don't right. have access to that. Um, do we have a... Teddy Ann, yes. Madam Mayor. There's a couple of things I'd like to clear up. Yes, ma'am. For clarification. One is the fact that when you come to a council meeting, if there is something on the agenda that you wish to talk about to the council, when you fill out a form that says you want to speak, you specify which item on the agenda you want to speak, and at that time, you can speak to that council regarding the agenda item. So, and the three-minute time is if you've got five people, they cannot talk forever. 
But if you have one, you can listen to the end. Otherwise, you almost have to time it because our council meetings are four hours, as you know. So that I would like to clarify. And the suggestion box. And the suggestion box is you can't have five council members going out and checking your old dilapidated building. And he doesn't have one. He's just convenient. But all of that would have to go through the city manager, who is in charge of our day-to-day -day operations in the city. So if a suggestion box was put up, then even though they can all discuss it, the actual inspection or action is up to the city manager. And as far as the message center that Mr. Patterson asked about, I know he can really use the telephone. Well, I can use the telephone, but what I'm talking about is other I know. And there must be a way somewhere that those could, that the questions could be posted so that people could go to City Hall or the Chamber and read the questions and the discussion. And Teddy, do you, do you think I'm about right on at least 25% of the people living in this town not hooked up probably, to the internet and this and that? So we just, so. you know, pretty much left out. Yeah. Yes, Robert? Uh, I've got a suggestion. The, the, uh, uh, suggestion box. I'm trying to answer Paul's question because I don't think he ever got an answer. Um, the the suggestion box. This is the first time I've, I've, I've seen this. Is this at City Hall, and has it already been set up, or is this an idea? Is, is this an idea? It was a question submitted to the chamber. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, we need to define who would be. I mean. I guess where, wherever it goes, it's going to be. It's being asked of the city government and the city council <laughs> and the mayor, including the mayor. I'm including everybody there. Uh, all those people should be uh, informed of what these suggestions are, and you know, it's up to them as as uh, council members or governance, whatever. Uh, to uh, do their research, uh, come up with ideas, and also take, I guess, more of a role where, you know, we're, we're blessed in this country to have a representative form of government. We are representatives of the citizens. Therefore, if I get a suggestion come to me, I, as a council member, want to seek out that person and have an open dialogue with them to see, you know, what they want, how, what their ideas are, and I can share mine uh, with them. It's all about communication. Uh, you know, as it is, uh, if it's going to, uh, you know, be at City Hall under the city manager's, uh, I don't say control or direction or whatever, uh, he's going to be responsible for getting that information to everyone that it applies to. Uh, if it is the suggestion box is set up at the chamber office, EDC office, whoever it is there needs to, will, you know, will have the task of getting it to who needs to be uh, informed as to what, what they are. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, once those rules are set up, then there will be accountability, which is what I was, I think Paul was alluding to, who's going to answer the suggestions or who's going to provide uh, response. responses to them. So you know, once that's once that's established, I think the suggestion box uh, will be a great uh, tool to open the communication uh, between uh, the citizens and the government. One one thing that we have to be careful, and again, it goes back to the regulations when when. The council, current council members get a, an email from, the example, the city manager, and it's addressed to all of us. We can't, and there's a big disclaimer at the bottom of those, you can't hit reply all because that's creating a form, and you're communicating with everybody. So the message board is something that's approved by the state uh, as a form of communication that's accepted. And that gives you a legal way to, to have a back and forth conversation. What's the difference between that and reply all? Yeah. Because all of the council members would be, would, are 
the, the message board allows you to, to have communications back and forth where a email is Well, you, no, but a message board is a one-way Exactly, but, and that's one of the quirks that, that, that makes it work, is, is that there's not, there's not interaction with anybody except those mm -hmm. council members. I mean, that's, that's what the legislature approved as a form of communicating and exposing the communications more so than actually answering questions. It exposes the, the communications between each council member. Then you can find out what the, what the feelings are, what the emotions are of each council member, and you can address that council member and say, I agree or disagree, and here's why. Um, the message board gives you that option because it's been approved. The, the, the strictness of our communications with each other and citizens, there's, there's the protocol that we have to, we have to follow. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to go that took an hour for the first topic, but that's good. I think we're having a good discussion here, guys. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on, though, to the current events. Um, because, you know, the, everything going on around us affects each and every one of us, even in Van Alstine. So, so what I want to, what, what, what some of the questions were, uh, that were some of the questions that were posed to the chamber were regarding the the media usage, which we were kind of just talking about, but not only internet media, but but uh, library, uh, newspapers. Etc. And how do the other cities and what's going on with them, uh, their infrastructure, their their regulations, etc. How does that affect Van Alstine? How does it affect how you uh, vote and, and act in Van Alstine? I'm going to start with Timothy. Okay, that's fine. I I love media of all kinds, so I take the leader, Jay Rodney. <laughs> I, w I look for the Herald Democrat, I kind of breeze through that. I do a lot of online, I do Facebook um, and other things like that. I look at other cities' websites. I also hang around McDonald's and other city businesses and talk to people. I think that just talking to people is probably one of the best ways to get your news in Van Alstine, actually. Um, what else? Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I just try to keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on in any way I can. Use it. I use the internet a lot. I research a lot. Larry. Uh, well, I read the Herald Democrat um, every day, every day we get it, uh, and I, I uh, get we get the Van Alstine Leader, and I and I read that. Uh, I read, read both carefully. I'm I'm kind of new to Facebook, but for a few months now I've been. I've been using that a little, a little better. The internet, I do, I do research on the internet. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, if I'm elected to the city council, then people are going to have my phone number. <laughs> and I'm going to be able to talk to people. Uh, if, if we have suggestion boxes, I'm going to get to see those suggestions. And, um, so that's, and, and, and conversations and hearing people in um, council meetings. And also, if, uh, if we ever get um, more town hall meetings, maybe a regularly scheduled town hall meeting in addition to the council meetings, mm -hmm. then I'll get to hear from you. I do Twitter as well. <laughs> you tweet. I tweet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it's important to keep up with national and international events as well because uh, it is I think important uh, to know what's going on. For example, Supreme Court just passed a uh, five to four opinion that uh, it is lawful to say a prayer at the beginning of each yeah. council of each council meeting. I got that and I zipped it right over to our mayor, so <laughs> he didn't discuss, you know, uh, whether we could, should, would. And uh, so, yeah, this type of thing is important to me. I also keep up on things uh, that are happening around, such as Agenda 21, uh, uh, American Laws for American Courts, and I try to be very informed of what's going on in the world around me. 
and how it could affect us, whether it be through you know, TCOG and the uh, uh, concept of uh, regionalism or whatever. And uh, I serve on the uh, Transportation Advisory <coughs> Council, and they're having some of the knowledge of what's going on in the world around me uh, helps me in, in voting and making the decisions on that council as well. So I think it's very critical to be uh, very informed and that it is through a lot through the internet as well as I subscribe to uh, both papers, the uh, Sherman as well, Harold Democrat as well as the Van Alstine leader. Well, Ryan, you are rocking right now, huh? <laughs> Jim? Boy, it's hard. <laughs> Internationally informed here. <laughs> I, uh, she is. I, I read the Van Alstine Leader, and then I borrow the newspaper from the dentist office and read it, and then the <laughs> <laughs> hold it back up neatly and put it in front of their door. But I, uh, <laughs> I have told them that I do that, and, uh, and they're okay with it. So uh, I, uh, I have to go visit a neighbor to be informed on what's going on in Sherman. Um, I spent, before I moved down here, several years as a market manager for Clear Channel Radio. Um, the most fun that I've ever had in any job. Media can be an excellent tool to get information out. Our station had something that not, of the 1,600 radio stations that Clear Channel had, we were the only one that had bending news. Because every once in a while, Something's not breaking news, so we had bending news. And I was asked by corporate, what do you call bending news? And I said, well, typically it's a lost dog. <laughs> and we would, we would interrupt our broadcast for bending news. And if somebody had a dog that was lost, several times Alzheimer patients um, were, were misplaced and, and misplaced themselves, and we would go on the air and stay on the air until that was found. But Media can be such an impressive tool, and it's immediate. With radio, it's immediate, um, and we always brag about that. The TV has to get their camera out, and then <laughs> they have to wait for a slot. We could we could do it more immediate. Uh, using the media to to give out information that so there isn't a misconception of a comment that was made uh, is an excellent tool, and working with the media respecting their, their power, respecting their abilities, and, and giving them a chance to, uh, to know about things, keeping them informed, uh, is, a, is a positive relationship with, with that. Um, and, and just talking to folks on the street, you know? I've, I've had a lot of conversations in front of the bank and the post office and, and sitting out on the bench in front of the restaurant. Um, keep your ears open. I have learned the history of Van Alstein from a group of gentlemen at the at the City Drug, <laughs> and I found out you got to edit some of that information because <laughs> not all of it is completely legitimate, and you got to edit out some of that. But that that was the joy that I would have is when I would have time to go sit with with the guys over at the at the at the drugstore, and I refer to them as my uh, my uh, committee of uh, advisors because they know the old Van Alstein, and they know the new Van Alstein that we're looking at, so it's informative. Yeah, I get the same thing with at the Senior Center, <laughs> <laughs> and the Eastern Star. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Jessica, I mean, you have so many options to get your information because you're, you wear five or six different hats, so what yeah. you say? That's, that's what I was going to uh, uh, focus on. Uh, my work with the uh, with the chamber, uh, I'm, I'm apprised with the uh, with the uh, activities and information that's going on there. Uh, same with the other entities. Uh, again, uh, keep Van Austin beautiful. Uh, the senior center. I'm on the board. And if you want to know what's going on as far as the history and the goings on in Van Alstine, visit the Senior Center. That's where the, the heart of this, of this city is. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yes, the, 
that as far as the social media, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or any of those things, but my wife is, my kids are, and if I need anything, if I need to know anything of what's going on there, all I have to do is, is go to them. They, they do my work for me there. Um, but uh, I do read the paper. Uh, I will say another uh, uh, praise of Rodney back there, his articles that he does, uh, the reporting that he does, is, I, I feel, is one of the most fair that I've seen. There, he gives a uh, an unbiased opinion. He reports the facts, and he is a very good source of uh, of what's going on. I mean, he recounts the council meetings, and I mean, I agree with 99.9% .9 of everything that's in there, if not 100%, because uh, uh, he reports actually, you know, what what happens and what's done. Um, as far as uh, uh, events uh, that influence decisions, I would encourage uh, everyone here, if you're not involved in any of the entities or organizations around Van Alstine, just like go visit the Senior Center, go visit the library. The library is an excellent resource uh, of information. Uh, you know, my, my kids go up there for the, for the gaming tournaments and stuff like that, but that also opens the door, gets them in there. There's a lot of history of Van Alstine there. Uh, you know, go to the go to the uh, American Legion on Friday nights. Uh, visit with all the all the vets out there having their having their meals out there at the uh, at the American Legion. There's uh, we we've got unlimited resources here to find out what's going on in the town. There's a lot of good people here. A lot of good people here, and uh, keep Van Alstine beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and join keep, yes. keep Van Alstine beautiful. Yes, because yes. <laughs> uh, Becky, gosh, bless her heart, she and and, and Judy have worked there more than more than their share of, uh, of getting things going uh, here recently. I don't know if y'all noticed the I'm um, doing a flood. Yeah, all the all the pots and the new plants and everything downtown beautifying the city. But uh, that's what Robert, I would encourage. Robert, you don't need to like yes, plug every group you're into right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't plug everybody. I love I love everything here. I wish I could, you know, I'm involved in a lot, but I would love to be involved in everything. Well, I agree with you. I, we have some wonderful groups here, organizations. KVAG has been doing some wonderful things, planting some flowers, put some pots out lately. Uh, they're working with the chamber to do a few things, so. Senior Center, I haven't been there, but I'm trying to get my husband to go. Anyway, um, there was just one other question, and then I'm going to take a couple questions from the audience for, from the current events. How many in this room have a library card? Please raise your hand. The Van Alstine Library Card, I mean. Yes. Yeah. Van Alstine. Van Alstine. Well, no. Well, there's a Smithsonian. Yeah. Okay, that was one of the questions. Okay, that was the answer. Um, I will now take some questions from the audience regarding current events. I would like, like to make a suggestion. Yes, ma'am. I think we have a great senior center. I really do. I love everyone, everyone down there. And I think we should make our council people more welcome at our center so they can hear what we have, you know, what our problems are and what we have to say. So we should welcome our council people, the people run for council. I think we should be open. I think you're right. You know, uh, uh, the chamber wanted to set up a, a, a meet the candidates at the senior center, but there was always a time conflict uh, because the candidates, most of them have a, a daytime job and they can't come during the day. And in the evenings, I know it was, it was difficult for you all to come out, which you're, you're beating that right now by, by showing up. But, but we did try to arrange that. But it's a valid plan. Well, I just, you know, I, I just feel like that the people, I mean, the, yeah. our, our senior citizens, mm -hmm. we need to welcome our council and yeah. the people who run the city. But can't come. 
We have one council member that visits very frequently, and I don't think we had to do anything special. No, you didn't. And she wanted to come, and Robert was there occasionally. And I, I don't know what else we could do to make him feel welcome. I think it goes back to the topic number one, that cohesion, you know, and, and some have only shown up when they're running for office. Right. But we did have one that came. We didn't have to do anything. Well, she's a girl. Thank you. Oh, they can't, but they can't. They're not supposed to campaign. Right. There was there was also that issue. Yes. Right. Um, but I just wanted to know that I feel like we're up there, we've been friendly enough. Oh, I don't know what else we can do. And there is the age. <laughs> okay, so you've got another you question about current events, or can we move on to the third topic? And then after the third topic, I think we'll take a little break, give everyone a little stretch of the legs. Any other questions? Laura? No. Rodney? Uh -huh. Uh, the Friends of the Library will start their monthly breakfast on June the 7th. Yes. Yes. The Center is almost finished, as I understand it, and uh, we're happy to do it again. Yes. Yes. Oh, that is correct. Okay, well, uh, on that note, let's move on to growth. Uh, we were talking about that earlier. Um, I believe Karen was. So, anyway, uh, regarding growth of Van Alstine, there are a number of issues here. There, there's the, the, the old town overlay, there are the new developments, there are the regulations, restrictions, all kinds of things that need to be discussed. But I am going to have to start limiting the candidates to three to four minutes so that everyone can have a say, um, and then the audience can have their questions. So let's see, this time we'll start with... Karen, I suppose. Regarding growth, um, how do you see the, the, the building requirements from old downtown versus Georgetown uh, and restrictions? How is that going to help or hinder Van Alstine and, and how it's going to grow and progress? Cool. <laughs> Georgetown does its things, it has an HOA. And that has nothing to do with uh, Old Town. And uh, the only thing that has been discussed that I'm aware of is the double fencing. And that uh, is something that should stay in a planned community and not be uh, in, uh, put on the rest of the town. Uh, so any new communities that grow or that develop or come about you know, yes, they can uh, have the requirements for the double fencing or the restrictions on the double fencing, but uh, we have it in old time and uh, it's not a problem. So, you know, growth. Uh, you know, there are lots of people who are building on them in uh, both places. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, there are actually a number of different things to go along with that. I just was trying to give a lead in, but there's a, the smart growth versus the flex growth, um, and business regulations and economic growth. How are we going to to promote economic growth in Van Alstine? Because with economic growth and population growth equals more money for the city we, uh, through taxes, etc., which equals fixing the roads and and a number of other things. Well, let me, uh, since yeah, I'm please. still on. I'm sorry, because I sort of led you into that, but the, the broader picture would be good. Okay. Well, if we're talking about uh, smart growth, that is a one world government or a uh, United Nations concept, and I'm against it. Totally. I mean, flat out, I'm against smart growth. Uh, so, flex growth, that's only a North Carolina item, and it has not been. Uh, distributed through the rest of the states. It is uh, originated from a classical liberalist. Uh, his name is um, John Locke Foundation, who is the father of classical liberalism. He was an English philosopher and physician 
regarded as one of the most influential of Enlightenment thinkers, and that is not for me either. I think that we need to have an American concept of growth like we've been doing and stay away from one world governments and uh, UN concepts where they use the uh, <laughs> beach over the, or they, they guide you into uh, how you want growth. It's moving things from rural areas into the city areas, having uh, controlled uh, housing, having a stack and pack, which means you have businesses down below and houses, uh, apartments on top, uh, trains or rail uh, transportation instead of uh, automobiles, and it's bringing everyone in and having the wilderness, not even for the cows anymore, if you look at the uh, Clip and Bundy situation. <laughs> So uh, I am against that type of growth, e either type of growth. Well, but, okay, uh, just just not to interrupt you, but let's let's try to keep that in context to Van Alstine. Yeah. Well, okay, it's smart growth. No, uh, <laughs> I said it. No, no to both of them. Okay. Well. <laughs> let me let me go on to Mr. Cooper. What are, what are your thoughts on growth of NFC? Uh, well, uh, as as Ms. Torger said, you know, Georgetown is a, is a planned development, um, and and they've got some rules, and they can abide by those. They've all agreed to that out there. Um, whether they're whether everyone lives by them or, or whether it's ever enforced, but there are rules down there because it's a, it's a homeowners, homeowners association. Right. Um, city center of Van Alstine, I, I don't see any reason why um, uh, Georgetown restrictions have to be placed on city center of Van Alstine. But that, that community has grown nicely. Um, and, and those are those folks, that, they're all neighbors down there. There's no reason to, to uh, push them around. Um, I'm not sure I understand um, uh, the terms as they apply to uh, to George, to uh, uh, Van Alstine, um, the, ter the, the terms uh, smart growth versus flex growth. Um, because I, uh, um, I I don't see that that, that Van Alstine is going to be can be forced to sign on to any um, international rules about how cities develop. I I think that. I think that uh, America knows how to grow cities, um, and and I I, just, I don't understand those two terms. Um, right. Uh, Does anybody else not understand them? They were actually <laughs> they were submitted <laughs> questions. Um, actually, Mary, I was hoping you did understand, no. but just in case you didn't, I have a. I, yeah, I see. I see. Right in there. I see a description. Of, yeah. Uh, of smart growth. They, they were they were specific questions sure. submitted, and basically, smart growth is the idea of everything being more compact. You stack and pack. You 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 build up from the downtown. You know, it's not the sprawl uh, uh, way of thinking as far as development. It's not the what is it called the. the Community sprawl or urban sprawl. 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 Thank you. It's the exact opposite. So there are two different ways of thinking, and the only reason those thoughts were, were, were key words are given to the candidates was because they were on the list of questions. And I just am trying to be fair. I had to research it myself. I didn't know. But but ironically, you know, Van Alstine does have that downtown, and it is growing, and there are people living there. You know, I'm one. Laura Dapkus has a some tenants and, and there are a number of offices as well, so that that's why it was presented. Um, Timberly, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Any yeah, questions? actually I do. I'm not a fan in general of um, smart growth. I'm not because it's, an smart e growth it's a federal EPA program, Environmental Protection Agency, not a fan of the EPA. I think they have their place and they do some really important work as far as protecting our citizens in the workplace environment but they'd be restrictive regarding the actual planning of the city. So having said that, our downtown, as you just mentioned, is the perfect example of what smart growth is. I mean, this is what cities used to be built. You have, it's called mixed use. You have businesses and residences and parks and walking 
you can walk everywhere, you have, we used to have a trolley, the interurban, so that's kind of a microcosm of what that would look like. The problem would be is that when you start to master plan the city that way, you start to um, majorly push for mass transit. Um, there are some nice things, and one nice thing I think are, are um, uh, bike trails and walking areas and hiking areas within an urban area, which makes it very lovely and nice. You can think Central Park in that regard. So I think overall this is not appropriate for Van Alstine's growth. It's absolutely not. So you know you have some master plan communities. That's what you know the HOA type communities are. We we do have them. We will have them. We're going to have more. Uh, we know that the Georgetown area is expanding. We know that the Manchua project or Manchua project is a possibility. Those will be master plan communities. But most of Van Alstine right now, outside that, that downtown business center, is just, here's a nice piece of land, I want to put a house on it. And our planning and zoning um, department in Van Alstine makes the decision what type of use a plot of land is going to be. And I think that's what needs to happen in Van Alstine. That's what's appropriate, it's what works, it makes the town have the feel that it has. We have the, quote, older section of town. We have some newer homes in the older section of town. But we're not going to put apartments in the middle of downtown. And so, you know, that's, that's how I feel about that. I think the downtown is phenomenal. It's absolutely incredible. And everyone I talk to talks about the jewel of the downtown that we have. Um, I think that, you know, we can polish up that jewel and do some wonderful things to try to promote Businesses, I know some people have already, like um, some of Mercantile Farm for Douglas for Floral, for example, encourage other businesses to come in there. And that we could potentially have something like a McKinney Square at some point in time. Although, although people have said they want it more rustic than that. They don't want it quite that polished because then we lose that historical feel and we don't want to lose that. At the same time, we're going to get growth of 75. And we want to encourage the growth while we want to get ahead of that growth so it doesn't overtake us, so we're not a victim of the growth that's coming. So that's how I feel about growth in Van Alstine. I think we can have the best of both worlds and be a wonderful city. So I, I got stuck on that. That's okay. <laughs> um, and, and I will answer with the description that I've heard of, uh, of um, uh, the, uh, the smart growth, um, I would disagree with that also. I, and I think the Planning and Zoning Committee has a good thing going, or has a good thing going, the Planning and Zoning Committee. Um, and uh, we can abide by that and grow by that. And, and uh, it, it'll, the plan will develop and so can Van Alstine. I have something very specific that, that this, this growth and when you talk about building requirements and restrictions, it's, it's very personal. We've all talked about downtown and what a great place it is. I live and work in downtown. I, I live in the loft above the drugstore and I have a wonderful landlord there and at where the restaurant is. The current situation you talk about growth and, and things that need to be done and, and, and the growth that's the potential that's there we have a current situation and this only applies to two-story buildings downtown we have adopted the 09 2009 fire code same fire code that Denison has um, same code that uh, Sherman has in a downtown two-story building, and this is the information that I have through through attorneys and through conversations with different cities that have, have acquired, if the abstract or the intended use of a two-story downtown building changes, it has to be brought up to that 2009 code. That means that each building, each two-story building, if I were to buy my building, I would have to bring it up to code, and that means fire suppression system, the sprinkler systems. That's about, for my building, is about $40,000. Our fire chief himself has said in a meeting, 
we could exempt that, but we're not. Because Plano has them, McKinney has them. You have to create value in a building, in a piece of property. That 1,700 square feet that I enjoy doing business in and the 1,700 square feet that I enjoy living in <coughs> is not the same value as what Plano has or Frisco or McKinney. You have to create a value where you can get a return on your investment. If I were to buy my building and I would have to put 40000 into it extra and then whatever construction I had to do upstairs, you cannot get that money back. You cannot rent a building for enough money to pay for those kind of improvements. Our fire chief has said we could exempt, but we're not. That was said in a, in a public meeting. Denison exempts. Denison reads the ordinance to say if you're going to build a new two-story building, you have to have fire suppression. You know that going into it. But they do not require, I talked to the fire marshal in the, at the city of Denison in his office, and he said we do not require sprinkler systems, even if there's a residence on one of the floors. That is a restriction that affects several buildings in downtown. You want us to grow, and you want us to be like Plano someday, then let us create value in those buildings and not be burdened with the expense and the requirements that, that we are currently burdened with. That brings us to the next uh, sort of level on that topic, which is the economic growth. Um, so at this point, let me open it up to uh, the audience. Any questions about how to promote economic growth in Van Alstine? Uh, any ideas? Yes, ma'am. I have one question pertaining to what Mr. Smith just said. Okay. Why does our chief our car chief have that power. That's right. Why does he have that power? Right. That's right. He's, he's yes. given the power by the city manager. Because well, that's the city manager that's that's involved, what too. The is. That's why we need to make the whole town. That's, that's what the problem is. That's right. That's, that's exactly why we're having this meeting. That's right. Just to discuss these things so you all are aware of them. Okay. Um, well, while I'm speaking, yeah. I live over what we used to commonly call Poor Hill, uh -huh. northeast corner of town. Uh -huh. Okay, he's been talking about putting in the suggestion box that there's a run-down house next to you. What good would it do to put it in there? There's houses galore over in that area. That's right. And the ones of us who try to keep our right. places up, our yards nice and everything, you know, we pay the high taxes like everybody in Georgetown or where else. My daughter has a house next door to me. It's just a freight house. We've lived there. I've lived in my house 50 some odd years. And she's lived in hers 30. We keep her yards. We keep her house for the, the type of houses we have. You know, attractive. Some people bought a house next door to her. They didn't spruce it up that much. They just did, they painted and fixed up a little bit and put a big wrought iron fence at the front. Her taxes almost tripled because of that. Yet across the street from her is what about as ramshackled as you'll ever see. <laughs> yeah. They pay yeah. no attention to that. That's what right. power, I mean, does, does our city government have any power in assessing our city taxes or does it all have to go through the rest of the county? County. County. Yes, county. It goes to the county. Well, uh, can, can one of the can I answer that, or if, if you know? I know that's the topic. The district that sets the sets the value of property. <laughs> we need to get different people. We need to appraisal this board. But it, 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 the city does not evaluate your property. Now we do have an ordinance that was passed, and we did budget ten thousand dollars for demolition. If you have a house that's falling apart and needs to be taken down is not redeemable and it's creating a hazard, we have the ordinance to do it and we have the money to do it. But, but, it's not being but done. it is not being done. Right. And now, let me add, the okay. powers the powers yes. there and and the money's there, but it's not being done. Yes, and, and that's how they're assessing your taxes. 
And I don't know, I got a letter that my taxes were going up. Yeah. Did anybody else get one? Yeah. I got one. Yeah. You know, I don't pay my taxes. But that's, you know, you you have to, I mean, that's how they do it. They don't come out anymore and appraise your, your house anymore. But there is a, there, you do have an option to refund it and uh, you do Bruce Stidham, who is now our tax assessor collector, had a course, had someone come in to, last year to show how you can do that. And uh, I think that it would be good to have something like that here in town so that people who want to learn how, how to appraise or assess That's or whatever. Yeah, I but I don't think that you people really understand. We do have a representative from Van, Van Austin on the yeah. taxing board. I won't say his name because it'll get me in the doghouse. Mm -hmm. But there is, they do have different representatives. I'll say Charlie Williams. <laughs> and one of the things that they do is they may, uh, we have a house behind our house, and they go down the highway and they took a picture of it. And so you have to understand how they're taxing you because at the end of the carport there's a storage thing about this thick. And that is considered an outbuilding. You are taxed for things that you have no ideas that you are taxed for. And when they sell a house, and I went before the taxing board and discovered <coughs> that when they sold a house in White Ride with the same square foot footage as the house that we had, our taxes went up. As was it in the same shape, it had not been remodeled. But because they based those taxes on the square footage, even in another town, our taxes went up. And you can take pictures of your place. You can go before there. And when I went up, I was informed that, well, you can go before the board, but I don't know that they will lower it any. But I can lower it a percentage if you wish to get go with that, and that's a guarantee. I went with the guarantee percentage because if I went before the board, they could refuse and charge me the full amount. So if you don't like your, your taxes, what you need to do is go up to Grayson County to the tax assessor's office and start talking to them, visit with them, find out their rules, find out if they're looking at your roof from an airplane or from a block away. They take a picture of one view and they charge you for things that you don't know you have, such as this out storage building we have that's a little thing at the end of the carport. So you don't know until you communicate with these people, but the, the city doesn't do. You've got your county taxes, and that's where it is. Okay, and they said... Uh, yes, like Terry was saying, it's up there, it's kind of like, let's make a deal. About 25 <laughs> years ago, uh, I they had my I get twenty seven nine for my house when I built it. Okay, they had it appraised for about one hundred thirty thousand dollars, and the guy that used to be up there, I think he's dead or whatever. What's his name? Teddy Tolson or something like that. I think it's Tolson. Tolson. I had him to come to Van Austin to my house, and he said, "Pat, I think it's still worth that." I said, "Well, I tell you what, you pay me what you think it's worth, and I'll move out of it." And that's what he my my house is frozen now. On the kind of disabled in '65, okay, they went up this year just like that lady right over said, five thousand dollars on my house. They can't go up on my taxes right now, but whoever inherits my house, they'll have to pay the tax on one hundred five thousand dollars, and I get twenty seven thousand nine hundred dollars for my house. And you tell me what's wrong? We have a gentleman here that's been trying to pose a question. Yes. No, I was trying to point to the mayor. Oh. 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 So, okay. <laughs> We're supposedly talking growth here. Right. Everybody's seen what's happened in Anna. You've got uh, CBS has gone in there. You've got Walmart going in there. That thing is turned into a zoo right. because they haven't the roads have <coughs> kept up yeah. the pace or anything mm -hmm. like that. Growth is the, there's a freight train coming down the freeway, <coughs> yes. and it's aimed right at Van Alstine. And all we're talking about is 
taxes here and buildings there and so on, if there's a master plan, or there better be, to deal with this growth when it gets there. That's what I said. The 20 year plan is what I was talking about. It needs to be done. It's not a really that place. Thoughts? Thoughts, anyone? How do we, how do we get there? Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just going to say, uh, I can't understand why Van Alstine has not gotten some nice apartments in this town. I know everybody thinks apartments run down sort of thing, but we could get some nice, uh, a nice developer, a good developer in here to build some nice apartments because at our church, we've had a, at least a couple of incidences where people had a job here or could get a job here, but there was no place for them to live, and they didn't have a, a car. It's one of those dire situations. So, you know, especially with the, the addition to the college, you know, if you've got people having to drive from Sherman or White Wide or places like that, they might prefer to live in Van Alstine. You know, I normally don't have answers to that, and that's really not how I wanted to, to, to okay. do this, but I actually have an answer for that. But I'm going to direct it to Robert because he could explain it better, the Palladium Project. Um, oh, yeah, we, we do have uh, that. The Palladium Project is a, uh, a uh, uh, assisted living no, it's independent living. Indep excuse me, independent uh, living center for the for uh, <coughs> seniors. It's on the north. Uh, yeah, north. It's on. It's north of. As you know, it's it's north, north of Wasigame. Wasigame. Wasigame is the name of the street, uh, and it's going to bring uh, uh, residential. Uh, provide uh, living for seniors. There's going to be 165 uh, units there. 120 are going to be based on uh, income and then 40, I believe 45, 40, 42, 45. Yeah. It's going to be private pay. That is, uh, is, is, is part of a uh, uh, economic growth uh, project here for, for the city. Uh, I've also been told way before I got here, um, uh, or I was told after I got here, but it was there was a planned development before <coughs> I got here that was in that same area, and it was supposed to bring the, what is it, the Brookshire's and Anna, the Taco Bell thing, mm -hmm. planned, there was a planned development that was going to be growth to the city of Van Alstine. The reason that it didn't come is because the city government could not work with the property owners or the developers to bring it here. And whether it's because of these restrictions that we're talking about, uh, they did not provide incentives. There was not any cohesion between our government and the people that wanted to get, get here. Right. So they said, okay, we'll just go down to Anna. That's right. So we, we lost it. We lost that potential for, for tax revenue, property taxes, what, whatever the sales taxes that were going to come to this area. My suggestion for economic growth, I'm going to make it real quick. Yeah, I was just going to say, well, how can we change that? How well, what we need to do is we need to pro provide incentives and a willingness, show a willingness to work with people that want to come here. Van Alstine has everything to me, has everything that a developer would want. Right. We've got the, we've got everything here that, that we need. We've got a good core of citizens. We've got a great school system. You know, we've got everything that is attractive here. We've got to figure out how to provide the incentives to get the people here. And also, downtown, like Jim was talking about, ease the restrictions that are on there that may be unnecessary to get people to want to put their shops or whatever downtown. Because I've also been told of the stories that, actually when I was, it was before I was living there in Tom Bain in the, in the uh, 60s, 70s, 
Van Alstein was a central hub between mm -hmm. Sherman and McKinney. Right. People came from all the little towns around here right. to Van Alstein. All the shops were full right. Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah. The that sidewalks was, were full. That was in the late 40s and yeah. uh, early 50s. Yes, ma'am. And, uh, and, you know, all we have to do is provide a little incentive for people to do that, and we can do that again. You make my point. Where are these people going to live and they hear fill these jobs? Everybody can't afford a house. That's what my point was. We need to get some nice apartments in here. So, you know, having this palladium stuff, you're going to have people working. Well, the palladium is only for people six. You have to be sixty-two you know, but years. Don't you have to have people? Well, right. no, what I'm saying is, yeah, you have to be sixty-two to even live there. I know, but there are people uh, in Robert, there to run the place. Robert, right? you forgot. You forgot one big thing. We could have had John Deere here. If it hadn't been for a certain few merchants right here to stop John Deere, but when right out here on the highway, and everybody's been south and seen the John Deere plant in McKinney, the business we could have had it right right here, but a few merchants stop. What Robert's talking about has been we have as a council have in, have approved. It's not a guaranteed thing that's going to be here. It's right. it's still in the planning stages. Van Alstein City Council voted to give them an incentive to be here. Matter of fact, the Palladium project. Matter of fact, there was even a special meeting to change a word or two so we could meet their qualifications. That that has been done. Holt Caterpillar, who has announced, and it's not a secret anymore, has expressed interest in and has bought property and has presented a plan that the city council has agreed to, to put a retail repair shop for Holt Caterpillar that they have all over here in Van Alstein. If this, they don't go to sign her. If there there's there's still there's still ifs, but the council has voted to give the incentives that they needed to, to consider Van Alstein. So that that even though it didn't happen, and John Deere is probably the best example of having right. I, we are doing things as a council to give companies incentives to come to Van Alstein. We're, that and, and I know exactly what you're talking about, and probably the, the who that you're talking about that, that blocks some of that stuff does not exist anymore. The council does not live that way anymore. We are very proactive in, in offering incentives to companies to be here. Even having a truck stop like that. <laughs> Timberly, any thoughts on that? Sure, as far as the apartments go, Suzanne. Um, there are some things that are kind of like a puzzle. There is a need for apartments. Uh, we have to consider the school district when we put apartments in because you're going to have a lot of young families. The other things we have to have locations, so planning and zoning has to be involved. It has to be a multi, um, multi-resident, what is that called? Multi-family. Well, yes, thank you. Right, multi-family uh, approval for a certain area. Uh, then you need the right builder, you need the right um, um, developer, you need a lot of pieces of the puzzle. I think that it'd be great to have a quality apartment complex here. Uh, I know that we had an opportunity for a low cost housing uh, apartment complex here. Hal uh, did pick that up. We chose to go toward the uh, senior citizens, the um, um, not assisted living, what is it Karen again? Retirement. They, independent, independent living. Independent living. <laughs> Instead, because it wouldn't tax the schools at this point. So there's a lot of um, things that are going to go into the decision to put apartments here. And some of it has nothing to do with the city. It has to do with the developers and builders and do, are they ready to put something here. So we need to work that direction. You're right. Will the infrastructure support no. units being built? Or? I'm not no. familiar enough yet to know where the pieces of land would be to know if the infrastructure is in place. Larry? Well, infrastructure has been brought up, and that's uh, that's something that's going to be vital. This is uh, pushing uh, uh, water and sewer lines, uh, uh, getting power, uh, making it available to businesses uh, who want to build. Um, also, uh, housing. Um, and I, I agree with uh, with incentives. I think we we should be trying to draw 
um, the business is in. We need them. They, they'll be vital to us. And right here along this road here is a, a, a great place for a lot of business. Um, and once uh, uh, once it looks like there's a market for, for apartments, then yeah, we need apartments too. And, and there are housing developments that are, that are planned also. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, there are plans to build more more housing here too. So. Yes, I've heard that from uh, um, the engineer McManus, and they anticipate about a thousand new uh, residents in the next three years or so uh, with, with housing developments. I don't, I'm not sure if they mentioned apartments, but that's something. Well, that, that's, that's something to work for because uh, she's right. Not everyone's going to want to come here and buy a house right away. Apartments are Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But there are homes direct. But we need to take it. I have a question for everyone here. Number one, when you talk about growth, even when the city approves the growth of something, whether it's palladium or golden chick or anything else, you have to remember, that's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. That may not happen this year. The growth in a year from now may be what was planned before us. The other thing is, if you want economic growth, I suggest that every, every the end of every week, ask yourself, how many times have I shopped in Van Austin right. and promoted the merchants that we have here right. because if you don't if you don't support our own merchants don't expect other merchants to come and put in a business you have to when you commute and you work out of town you think well I don't have time but you've got the weekends and we have businesses that struggle all the time and many of them do not depend on Valentine people Nope. So ask yourself, have I shopped in Van Austin at least once this week? It'd be nice if you do more than once. But I would like to suggest everyone ask themselves that question because if you want economic growth, the first thing you have to do is support it. That's right. That's right. Amen. And meet back in 10 minutes, which will be 8.30. Please don't leave. Please come back. We'll talk fresh air. And then we'll, we'll talk for the next two minutes. Keep your brain showing up. This is better than I expected. Welcome back. Right. I see we lost a few of you, but I, I, I understand that. But in any case, I think so far we're having a very good uh, discussion. Um, and let's go ahead and continue with uh, on to number four. <laughs> touched a bit on taxes and uh, we're going to combine the other fun topic of city finances. But before I go any further, let me just explain to, to some of you, I don't have anything to do with making decisions in this town uh, as far as taxing and things like that. I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to provide a platform. Don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, I don't know the answers to the, these questions. And, and, and not necessarily, uh, neither do the, the city council uh, incumbents nor those running for office, but this is just an opportunity for us to discuss them, okay? Um, and again, the idea is to hear their, their points of view, their ideas, their thoughts, and, 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 and then couple them with our reactions and what we think. But by no means do, do I anticipate, nor should you, that we're going to reach any solid conclusions tonight. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, wouldn't that be nice if we could, but that's it's unfortunately not the way it works. So what we're doing is just, you know, uh, having a, a, a conversation, and that's the main thing. And I think it's more enlightening uh, for all of us to do it this way. So, again, thank you all for coming. Let's go on to number four. Taxes and city finances. Um, there have been some some questions about transparency of the city's funds, how they're used, how can you access them online, <coughs> excuse me, or other ways. Um, uh, see budget increases. Uh, what else are my notes? 
a number of different things, review and rebid of city services and oh, activities like this. I <coughs> Excuse me again. So uh, let's go ahead and just jump right into that. Uh, any of the candidates uh, choose to begin <coughs> talking about taxes and city finances? Oh, come on now. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask Robert because he does like oh, money. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. I've been on council since uh, uh, February. Um, as far as uh, transparency of, of expenditures, I've got to see, uh, I've seen more being on the council than I did not being on the council. Uh, that's a given, I guess. Um, uh, the regular review and review of city services and activities. Uh, Uh, I believe that's in regard to like the trash pickup, the, the, the city work. Uh, okay, as far as far as I know, that I haven't I haven't been exposed to that yet. Being a council member, uh, the budget comes up uh, this summer uh, for approval, I believe, in August. So uh, I, I intend to really. Uh, uh, be actively involved uh, with that process. Uh, the uh, council requirements, uh, property owner, city property taxes, city. the water rates, I was actively involved with that. Uh, hopefully, uh, we won't have that problem again. Uh, and I hope that has been resolved to everybody's pleasure there. When are you going to get our return? Business owners and, and sales taxes. Um, and taxes never too high. Uh, yeah, the, that last, the last comment uh, where it says taxes, can they ever be too high or not high enough? Yes, they can very well be too high. Mm -hmm. um, the way uh, that I see it right now, our uh, uh, city taxpayers right now, uh, I've seen the numbers, the comparisons to the different uh, towns, and it's always been uh, purported uh, that we are below other cities, which uh, I don't really. I mean, I, I can't. I can't see that being a taxpayer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't seen that yet. Um, but, um, you know, getting back to, I know I'm backtracking back into growth. Uh, with the more taxpayers we have in, this, in the city, the tax burden on us that are existing here now will go down because we will have more to share that burden with. So growth would be, uh, that's, that's why I, I, I am pro-growth for the city. Um, the uh, uh, unfortunately do, and, and we talked about this before, um, based on the history of uh, city uh, administration not taking care of business as far as maintenance uh, uh, and building building that kind of things into the into the budget to prevent. Uh, the problems that we have now is the reason why we have the problems that we have now. It's a pretty simplistic statement, but uh, uh, to work through that, um, you know, that's what we're going to be uh, uh, getting this budget in line uh, this year to address the problems that we have, which are uh, uh, the water lines, the streets, and the infrastructure. Uh, because uh, that has to be in place when, when the growth gets here. And in order to bring water to the west side of the highway, different things like that, our infrastructure has to be in place uh, to do that. And that's where we need to be focusing on. Uh, if, you know, get into it, I, I get into it. I don't 
claim to be a superman or anything like that, but there's got to be some expenses uh, that can be cut in order to uh, achieve what we need to uh, to prepare for the growth. Is that off the topic? Or? That, no, that's good. Thank you. <coughs> um, Mr. Cooper, Larry? Um, well, I, I, I think there is transparency. I think that, that the city hall, the people there, have worked really hard to make sure that things are transparent. Now, whether now how easy it is to decipher the annual financial report, that's another thing, yeah. But uh, <coughs> there is transparency. Um, and um, taxes, of course, everybody knows I mean, that, that water rates were raised. Um, and I understand that, that, uh, that, that they were uh, raised way too high. Uh, in the beginning, um, and, and primarily, from what I understand, it's, it was based on that the, that the increase was based on some some uh, erroneous data that they got from someone who did a study, and so the city city council passed it, thinking that they had no choice. I believe. Now, to Ms. Uh, Torber's credit, I don't believe that she voted for the increase. No, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a definite. <laughs> And so, uh, but they've been lowered again. Now, they're not as low as they were. Um, and, and from my, just some rough calculations, it, it appears to me that water rates, anyway, are, are somewhere in between what people in Sherman pay, they pay more, and, and what the people in Anna pay. Uh, might have something to do with the growth that they've experienced, I don't know. But anyway, our rates are somewhere in the middle there. And I don't, uh, I, I would have a tough time voting to, uh, to increase water rates again anytime soon. Hopefully they'll never have to be raised. And I think Mr. Jaskin makes a good point um, that, that the growth is, uh, is going to help us out there. Um, we shouldn't have to raise taxes or, or water rates. Um, taxes ever too high or not high enough? Well, they certainly can be too high. <laughs> um, and and uh, well, hopefully we won't have to burden the citizens with more taxes. And, and the growth will, will take care of that. So. <coughs> and regarding the, the, the review of city services and... I, I don't know how often they're reviewed, and I... Um, um, they should be regularly. Um, we... Uh, That's kind of an open-ended question. I didn't uh -huh. mean to throw that on you like that. But yeah. uh, no, I just well, that's okay. submitted, and I want to make sure that I'm covering well, yeah, I, I think that's a responsibility that the council has to, to review those, um, uh, probably annually at least. Mm -hmm. As with any contract or anyone with hire, I mm -hmm. so. Okay, Jim? When I first ran four years ago, we had a, a, a political forum on the east side and, and uh, east side coalition that I was proud to be a part of. I brought up the point that of transparency. The budget was not online, and nothing was online. And I was told by our, our city manager at the time that we, if we don't have a website, we don't have to put it up there. And I said, you do have a website. You have a web address. That's all it takes. That means you have a website. If you choose not to develop it, it's immaterial. But I started. And, and I'm going to toot my own point a little bit, this transparency of having the budget online, the check register online. When I first was elected, I asked for a copy of the check register every month. And it has been included in my packet, and then it developed, grew into everybody got a copy of the check register. I was told by two sitting council members that pointed at me and said, you have no right to ask for that information. I said, my dog has the right to ask for that information. That's right. That is open, that, that, is, that is public information. That's right. We had absolutely nothing on our website when I was first elected. This, this has been done. We won an award for transparency, mm -hmm. oh. financial transparency. Mm -hmm. The required information that, that has to be on there is on there. But it's still not complete transparency within our city government, in my opinion. Um, we talk about the, the need for infrastructure on the west side of 75. We did. I agree with that. 
you can't you can't grow you can't build a house without a foundation you can't have a housing development if the city doesn't do their share to get infrastructure to that development the developer does all of the all of the infrastructure just like they did in georgetown the the developer does all of that but we've got to have a pipe there ready to, to connect to a development You've got to spend money, but you also need to take care of the east side of Van Alstine that has been neglected for decades, literally. There is not one penny that I've seen that is specifically dedicated to replace and repair and upgrade the infrastructure that we have on, as an example, the, the central business district. Are we just going to wait till it completely collapses and no businesses have access to utilities? Is that we, we've got to think about both of them at the same time, Mr. Cooper? With with all due respect, there will be a rate increase in water next year. It it I, and I I don't want I realize that's that's the comment to make right now. That's a, that's somebody that's running for office. I, I will admit that I have more information, that I've been exposed to more information than you have. Water rates and sewer rates will go up next year. That, that is a guaranteed fact. And if you're elected, I, I want everybody to remember that you said that's good for several years. We had a previous council member that said, these are the rates that, uh, that I suggest, and they ought to be good for three to five years. We went up the next year. Mm -hmm. Big time. You, you will mm -hmm. not see, and it's not even a practical thing to not have rate increases. The city of Howells is a, is a real good example. Their, their consultants and their, their, their advisors said you need to go up every year. They didn't. They said 7% every year is what you need to have. They waited for three years and then they went up 21%. They, they did what they were told to do, but they did it all at one time. I'm reading prices at the restaurant this week. What I should have done, because I haven't done it for two years, what I should have done a year ago was to raise prices by 6%. But the mistake that I've made and the, the shock that my customers are going to have is I've raised my prices by 12%. I should have done 6 last year and then 6 this year. The fact that, that that there's any indication that we're not going to have a rate increase is just simply not going to happen. We will have rate increases. We, we know what's coming down the pike for us. We know the expenses that we're going to have. When you add $2 million to the debt, like we've done with Public Works and the Fire Department, you got to pay for that. That's got to come from somewhere. The, the anticipation is it's going to come from from rates. I mean, that's, all, that's the only thing you can do, and I'm, and I'm not trying to berate you, but the fact is, we will have rate increases next year. Everybody in this room will be affected by it. it, it it's, it's a given. Council requirements, um, property owners, I assume that is people that have a business in Van Alstine should be able to vote. Is that is that what that question came to? The, the question originally was: uh, should it be a requirement uh, to be a city councilman um, if you're setting property taxes? You're a property owner. Mm -hmm. If you're using the city water, you right and, uh, because you're setting the property tax rates. And, and that's and been discussed. I wanted to be sure that was the and, proper and question. Yeah. Right. And that so that has been discussed that. ever since I've been here. We have uh, we have people that run businesses in town. That live outside. So, uh, and, and you got it. And the rule is, the law is, uh, I believe, Texas state law, mm -hmm. not just Van Alstine law, that you have to live within the city limits, right. not the not the ETJ. That's right. Uh, that that's a given. Now, I'm going to step forward for just one quick comment on on the on number five. We don't have, and if I'm if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit it. But I don't believe I am. We don't have one single department head or city manager living inside the city limits of Van Alstine. That's right. 
they have all chosen and the city manager in his contract negotiation was allowed to not live inside the city limits. Right. We are. That's right. Yeah. But department heads get to go home to another town or another uh, another development. They leave the city limits of Van Alstine. How can you get a feel of what's going on in your town if you don't even live here? That's, it. That's right. That's right. I, I walk my dog four times a day and we take different routes sometimes. I just fall on this leash when we get old. But I, I walk all over this town, especially the central business district. I'm involved in this. I live here. I work here. Why are our department heads and more specifically our city manager allowed to not live inside the city? That's right. Timothy? Mm -hmm. Do I spend no money here? Um, it's already been stated that there, the city just wanted a word for transparency of our city finances. Like Jim said, our, if you go to the city website, which I've, I'm aware that people can't all go there, I have a solution for that, hang with me. But there is the, um, the budget is there, the um, checkbook is there, the check register, as well as the, the annual audit is posted there. So if you want to see any of those items, you can just go right to the website and see it. If you don't, the public library has um, computers that you can go access, and the librarians would be happy to help you to be able to pull that information up and see it online, possibly print it out. And in addition to that, you can make an open records request with the city. You can go down and simply fill out an open rec records request, and they'll print it out and hand it to you. So you can take it home and take a look at it. So. I'm very happy to know that there are many ways to get those sure. items. I've done that, and I, you know, I have a cost. recommend it. <laughs> if they decide to charge you. No, no, they're going to charge you. A few cents me. is it? A, I don't know what it is, but anyway. Five dollars and seven cents, day before yesterday. Yes, okay. they charge. All right. <laughs> okay, so that's very good. The main point is cost. Timberly has a library card. Yes, I have a library card. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a free way to go and look at it, is to go to the library. library. Um, it's city of Van Alstine. Dot yes, yeah, dot all, all, of, all of those documents are required by the state of Texas to be on your website. It's not because we're voluntarily we're good guys and we're just that's right. Big deal about well, transparency. We, we are required. Well, we're required to do that, and we did a good job, Tim. Yes. We did a great job. Yes. But at one time, four years ago, that wasn't even thought of. But mm -hmm. the award we won was because we did what we were supposed to do. Right. Not yes. because we went beyond what we were supposed That's to do. Right. Okay. But not every city has. Yes. Right. I'm interrupting myself, but it's just a point of order here. I think she should be able to finish the <laughs> Yes. That's okay. True. Thank you. And that's all right. I just want everybody to be aware of where you can get the information. That was the point of my going to that um, link. As far as regular review and rebid of city services and activities, um, I've been in uh, leadership at the C, C level in many different times in my life, and you always have an annual or at the, at the least biannual review of most of the services, whether it's your copier service or your, your uh, drinking water service or whatever it is. You want to look at options every year, your telephone, your internet. You want to do comparisons and bids, uh, and I encourage the city to be able to do that. Um, as far as budget increases based on population growth and inflation, uh, we are sitting in a potentially very inflationary environment. Anybody that follows you know, national uh, economic indicators is going to be very aware of the fact that right now we have just been through a deflationary period and we're about to see inflation, which means that right now costs are probably the lowest we're going to see them again uh, in the next 20 years. And, Inflation will rise, interest rates will rise, things are going to go up in cost. As far as the city goes, um, growth is one of the ways, as Robert Jaskin mentioned, growth is one of the ways that we diminish some of those costs as citizens as we have growth. We have more rooftops, we have uh, increased ad valorem taxes, which is your property taxes coming in. If the city can keep the rate steady, then even though the property values are going to rise at the county level, the city can help the citizens by not raising the rate here. And the more rooftops that we have, the more income comes to the city. And that will help us to be able to, to grow and uh, keep up with that inflationary rate. But inflation is going to happen. 
Um, I'm not sure on the water rate. I can't speak into that because I don't have, you know, inside information, so to speak. So I don't know where that's at. But I would love to be able to see us grow at a steady enough pace that increases to our water and other infrastructure uh, costs are not going to be too taxing for us. Uh, as far as the, um, let's see, the, the uh, okay, I had a thought here. Give me a minute. <laughs> Okay, our council, our city council just approved in the last city council meeting a loan by Public Works to approve the purchase of equipment. Now, this was budgeted in August and came up again for, you know, a vote because the uh, department had gone out and they found equipment at a reasonable price. They, you know, they brought all that back to city council. They already, we found a very low cost loan. I believe it's 3.1, is that what it was? 3.1% uh, for that loan. and. That will purchase equipment to investigate pipes underneath of the city, to be able to uh, use cameras to look at what's going on underneath of the roads. If there's some equipment to repair those uh, while without digging up the streets. If we have to dig the streets up, there's equipment to hold back the ground so that, that our city staff is safe while we're repairing some of the street messes that we have. and then also to properly repair the streets themselves. Um, so all of that infrastructure slowly over time. We'll need to triage it. Triage means that we, we take a look at everything and we decide where is the worst case scenario. Sometimes you can't tell that from how bad the roads are. Sometimes you have to get in underneath and look at what pipes are rusting out, what pipes are crushing because they're clay, and then you triage all of that. But I'm really happy to know that with a very low cost loan, our city has the ability now to begin to look at some of those things and repair them. And I hope that we continue to do that type of thing. Um, I think if we don't want to buy new equipment every single year, we have to be looking at things like, rather than kicking the can down the road and um, deferring maintenance, we have to start planning for when the next set of uh, equipment is going to need to be purchased and then prioritize our things and begin to budget for those things. That has not been done in, in the uh, past history from what I could tell and what I've heard. Uh, but that's something that I think that I can help with and I think that's going to be very critical for the city. Thank you, Kimberly. And Karen, the last one to speak on uh, Transparency, I, of course, have been following Susan Combs, who was our comptroller for the state of Texas. And uh, I did talk to the city staff as well about making sure that everything was on the website and uh, the importance of that, of uh, being tr uh, open and having everything available for the citizens to see. Um, <coughs> the for example, the trash pickup and that, yeah, we uh, changed this past time, uh, past year, uh, from one company to another company. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, people aren't happy with that because we've gone from uh, two pickups per week to one, and then, you know, you don't know when they're coming or when they're not because of holidays and whatnot. So, uh, there's a piece of paper that answers that question. But uh, it's not always, well, the ice storm, you know, the streets weren't taken care of, so the trash people didn't come. Things happen. Yeah, but I'm saying people are not happy with uh, this, uh, or they would like to know, uh, have another review. So I think it's something that does have to come up. We have several contractors that uh, the, com the city is employing that we have no, uh, the council is not uh, required to go over. Uh, we have, for example, you know, the engineers, McManus and Johnson, and I just looked at this past month's uh, accounting of payable check register and uh, Gee, $17,895 just for the engineers there. Um, I would like uh, to be, I think it should be something that comes to council as to uh, what engineers are there and uh, why we're contracting with these people. Uh, we have uh, several contracts that we're dealing with. 
uh, Bureau of Veritas, and we have uh, the change came from uh, the EMS whenever we, uh, <laughs> the last audit pointed out that you know, we were $5 million uncollected funds. So you know, they changed companies, but then there was a problem with getting uh, the, um, what is it, Social Security account, account yeah, and uh, so I mean, there's just been a lot of uh, problems with some of these things that uh, question, you know, why wasn't uh, someone more aware of what was going on? But we do have, you know, a bunch of uh, contractors that we're dealing with that is not, uh, the information is not available to the council. Uh, we have, uh, it is true, uh, the, a whole bunch of equipment in both the public works and the fire EMS was uh, purchased, and that is putting us very nicely into debt. Okay, well just to kind of redirect, how, how can the council then become aware of these uh, expenditures? And how, can they debate them? We did debate them. It was debated. Uh, like I said, I, I did not approve the budget back in, when it was August, September. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when it came up again, uh, there was a vote. But when you look at the payout, the uh, total cost, principal plus interest, our total debt right now is fifteen million mm -hmm. thirty-two thousand ninety-eight dollars and fifty cents. That means that every citizen in this town owes four thousand nine hundred and thirty-five dollars. Wow. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Cooper, do you have any ideas on the, uh, how we can make it more so that the council is more involved in this, uh, so that our debt does not increase, for example? Well, I know that there was a there was a budget meeting, uh, and, and, and everything was discussed there. And then there was further discussion in the council meeting, and uh, uh, councilors can can vote uh, in favor of or, or against any any loans such as, as we've taken out. Um, uh, I, as far as getting the information, um, I right. just if, if we're not getting it, then we need to demand it. And I I think that uh, I I think that the the uh, staff will, will get it to us. Um, I, I'm confident that, that we can get the information that we need and that we, we do have opportunities to debate these things and, and uh, we'll be able to do that effectively and vote accordingly. <coughs> I mean, we would hope so. I mean, that's the whole idea behind having a council. Sure. Maybe we're setting new precedent by having this conversation, hopefully. Um, Tim, really, any other thoughts on that? Um, no, I really don't have any thoughts on Jim? Um, the flow of information from the, the current management of City Hall is inconsistent among council members, I'm assuming, because I don't get information. The things that I learn about the city, I read in the newspaper. I should know about those things before it hits the newspaper. Right. I should right. get an email right. that says, here's, here's what's going on. There is a lack of consistency among current council members. Some get information and some don't. And that is a huge fallacy. It is. Do you know and why that is? Why is that? Jim? The city manager, our city manager, our city manager will not talk to us. That's right. And contrary to what everybody said, we are extremely discouraged to talk to department heads. Department heads. I can stop them in the parking lot and look at them and, stop and pose a question, not a gotcha question, just a general question, and they do not answer me. That's right. Well, the point is, how, how can we change that? How can we, we change the city managers. 
change it. No, go we'll back to city administrator type duck in strong America. Well, okay. like, all right, that's one option. But 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 aside from that, we have new people running for city council, so I'd like to hear from them how perhaps they can change it. Um, and I think what's very clear is that the, the some of the, the people running, uh, I think everyone this year running this term anyway, they want to be more communicative uh, amongst each other as well as amongst the other entities of the city. So if there are any thoughts out there, Scooper, you're going to say this one. I hate to put you on the spot, Mr. Jessica, but is this a similar experience that you have found that the city administrators are not in communication with you? Um, no, I have not been shut out. I've been given information before the meeting uh, as far as what agenda items are to be discussed, uh, status of the, uh, you know, where, where we stand on Palladium, uh, you know, th things like that. Uh, going back to the uh, increased debt, uh, here again, I came in after the budget was approved, but the budget was a balanced budget, was not. It was, wasn't it? But the, the printing was, on the pieces of paper yeah, were that, that's in I mean. balance, yes. Yes, okay. And in that budget, uh, there was built into it the possibility of purchasing new equipment for public works and uh, EM, EMT vehicles, okay? And it was my understanding, the reason that I voted for it, is that the cost of the equipment came in less than what was actually projected in the budget. The rate, as rates are still dro were still dropping at the time, were still dropping, I mean, were lower than what was projected. Therefore, the payments were less, the term was long. Uh, you know, we got preferential, uh, I won't we'll say preferential, but we got attractive financing terms. And the way it was conveyed to me was that, especially on the public work side, that we were in danger of being out of compliance as far as the quality of the water and if we had more breaks and whatever, uh, the fines and the uh, penalties plus the cost of the repair for those damages were going to exceed the debt payment that was projected. So that is why I voted for the increase in the debt at the time. Now, if, uh, if rates go up, we're going to be sitting in a better position because any excess funds that we have that we could earn interest on, you know, if we see rates increase 3 to 4%, which probably won't happen but could happen if something drastic were to happen in the economy, we would be actually earning more than what we're paying in interest. So based on that, you know, I don't see rates going down much more than what they are right now. So that was, to me, a sensible des decision because one, we were in need from a public work standpoint, and two, we had an attractive offer there on the table. So from business sense, I saw that that was the right decision to make. The, as far as total debt, no, I don't agree that we should be increasing the debt. I also I tried to make it clear in the meeting when I was asking uh, uh, the fire chief and whatever about the uh, vehicles that we were buying, and he looked at me and said he understood that that was not going to be an every year deal. And if these vehicles last 10 years, then we're going to ride this one out for 10 years. And we were going to work on the budget as far as building in deferred maintenance on the deal to where they don't wear them out in three years and have to buy another one. So that's what I'm going to be working for towards as far as the budget for the next year. We're going to find a way to get it in order like we're supposed to. No, they're not going to get, we're not going to increase the debt $2 million per year every year. 
but this I saw as an immediate need, and we had a good opportunity to take care of it. You know, a long-term, short rate, I mean, low rate uh, financing opportunity. So, you know, if, uh, you know, I, I am not committed to increasing the debt year after year after year. We do need to pay it down. And what our job as council is to uh, work through the, you know, have the budget workshops and come up with ways to cut expenses that may be excessive in other areas to pay for this debt. And I'm not one to raise taxes, raise rates, or whatever. I'm for cutting expenditures. That's it. So, and uh, Jim, I agree. Inflation is going to cause rates to go up. That's a great fear. It, it, it's going to. But there's also room in every budget to cut expenditures, and that's, that's right. what our task is. One one point, a counterpoint to, to your statement. Yes, sir. That we when we talk about buying a new ambulance, their hope, their wish, and and the hope was the word that the fire chief used. That we get a vehicle to last 10 years. Historically, we haven't even come close to that. Three years is the limit that, that we can keep an ambulance. Um, I mean, just the, the wear and tear, uh, whether it's the way they're driven or they're not they're not made to, to last long enough. The, 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 his proposal was that we buy one every year and we have three ambulances and this one, the new one, is first out. And then when we buy the next new one, that, that, that one goes to second out. So it gets, it has wear and tear on it, so we're not going to use it as much. It's a very logical and, and a very strong business decision to do that. But the problem is, if we have an ambulance that was only going to last three years, we finance that last ambulance five we years. bought for five years. Where is the financial, where, where's the financial advisor seeing that? Where you buy something that's, that you know is only going to last three years, you but you finance it for five. <laughs> where is the logic behind that? That's what I was opposed to, that, that type of thing. You're asking me, but I wasn't involved in that decision at the budget point or at the city council. But, so but that, that's, 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 that's a reality. Okay. That's, that's the fact of, that would of what seem, came out. That would seem obvious, but I don't know what would end of the decision. Um, at this point, let's take a, a couple questions from the audience. Can, I'd like to respond, though, to, uh, and I've been trying to talk, but wait, being very obedient and waiting for my turn. Uh, it's nice to say that we need all these things. There's things at home I would love to have, but my budget doesn't allow it. When we're spending other people's money, it's much easier. There have been options for TCOB, uh, having different uh, company or different communities, municipalities uh, purchase the things and sharing these things. Our people would not even consider that. And it was brought up. So everything had to be new and everything had to be right then. And then uh, the comment was made, well, in 10 years, are we going to have to go through this same gyration again, 10 years spending uh, whatever the total millions of dollars that we spent. Uh, it was $1.885 million, including principal and interest. Or, yeah, principal and interest. So, you know, again, two million. Uh, I just don't understand from a practical point of view and from my own personal budgeting point of view that the city can afford this and we have to get people who will say no. That's right. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, let's open it up to only two questions from the audience because we're, yeah. Getting late. Oh my goodness! It's <laughs> <laughs> I got. It. Yes. Can I speak? Yes, Mr. President. Uh, I got one thing, and I promise you, I'll leave you alone. Okay. Uh, Kimberly, you made a statement, and I heard you retracted in the paper because I didn't read it in the paper about when we had city administrator versus city manager. We was just as bad a shape as we are now. That's not true. 
That's absolutely not true. And we, I went to City Hall and paid that $5 or something that you don't think they charge you for the paperwork <laughs> myself the uh, other day. And I'm going to tell you, what we've done is city administrator type government. We've got four. I wanted to keep on topic. Okay, well, what I'm talking about is, is this right here. We got four big things. See, what she done stepped on my toes. I spent 19 years on this city council. I know what it was. Right. So, what I'm saying is we had we were four big... about taxes and city finance. Well, that's what I'm talking about, city finance. That's what I'm talking about right now. Right now, we $15 million, just like Karen said. We don't just keep on spending money and know, know where to get it. One thing we've done as a city administrator type government, we put money back in the budget and saved and saved until we was able to pay down. Now they put it on the credit card, and that's wrong. See, so, I mean, there's some people here I'm looking at right now that remember the good old time. Now, I don't think you people remember the good old time. Because we had money at one time, but we ain't got nothing now. Not a dime. And if this place, if it's something don't turn around, this place is going to be just like Westminster. It's going to go under. I'm telling you. Since you addressed it to me, can I reply to you? Yes. First of all, nothing that I've ever said has been specific to you, Pat. I wasn't here, you're right, and I don't know how things were run. But if the question or the statement had been made that our debt was a certain level prior, and what I did is I actually went back and I looked at the 20-year plan. In the 20-year plan, and in the article in the paper, I stated the exact place in the 20-year plan it is. I pulled the numbers straight out of there that said what the debt was at the time. I'm comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges, because back then it was the, the, the only the principal debt, it wasn't including the interest. It, it did same. include interest. Yes, uh -huh. yes. yes. it did. It did. It did. It did. It did. Okay, yeah. Yeah. my apologies, because when I read it, the way I read it, the, the numbers that I saw there were not including the debt. I mean the interest, rather. So. Those numbers then said that our debt was at $3,911 per person. How much? And what I was correcting myself on is because I said that our per capita debt was at $2,841.50, but I was not including those two new loans, and that brought it to $3,053.76 per capita debt. Now, a healthy city would be right around the $2,000 range. So somewhere between $2,000 and $2,500 per capita debt is a, a real healthy place for the city to be. And that would be the place we want to work toward by doing exactly what you're talking about, by putting money aside for, for the future purchases that are necessary as opposed to spending in arrears. Um, and being in catch-up mode all the time. So my apologies if you thought that I was speaking about you specifically. I was not. I was simply... I know it. You speak about my count. Responding. This is starting to sound suspiciously like the city council meeting. Uh -huh. so well, I, right now, the thing is, I wasn't responding only at the time to I understand. Ms. Kleiber's question. And, and I do like the report, but, but we, we're, we're running a little late, so we're going to go... I'm going to give each candidate a two-minute limit to discuss the biggest topic of all, but I think it's kind of been interwoven with everything this evening, which is governing issues. Um, and I'm not going to ask anyone in particular to start, because I might just ask Mr. Curley over there, but uh, then we'd be here for a while. But if you could please limit it to two minutes, and let's just uh, get a good feel for how what your stance is on big government versus small, less intrusive versus more controlling, uh, and, and how you're going to go about achieving Whichever one of those is your goal, uh, if you are elected city council person. Um, if anyone would like to start, please go ahead. But like I said, let's keep it a little short. Because okay, start. Start your. Call. There you go. <laughs> well, I consider myself uh, very conservative, and I'm I'm not in favor of a, of a, a big a bloated government. Now, I think um, nationally, um, we we have a bloated government. I think we have a huge problems um, uh, financially and, and with the, the size of government. It's just unmanageable, I think. Um, I think here in Van Alstine, I don't believe we have, have a bloated government. Um, I, and I, I think we do well with, with the mayor, city council. And I'm in favor of the city manager and, and uh, haven't had trouble 
a symptom of, of a bloated government is that, that you can't deal with people. You just can't even get to the people. My own personal experience, not as a councilman yet, because I, you know, I've never been elected to anything. This is the first time I've ever run for anything. But, but I have spent some time with, uh, uh, with Frank Baker and uh, with, uh, with the chief of police and with Steve White. And I, I found them to be uh, approachable. So um, I, I don't know what, what's, what the difference is, but, um, but I haven't had difficulty talking to those folks. And I, and I, now, I haven't spent any time, really, um, except at council meetings, with the uh, fire chief. Um, however, I did have one question for a, 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 a member of his department. Um, uh, the fellow gave me an answer, and I wasn't really expecting a call from the chief, but the chief called and gave me a, even more information. And I think, I think that's small government. I, I think we have a small government here. We don't have a bloated government. Uh, accountability. Um, uh, uh, city councilmen are are uh, uh, accountable in that you know they, they only have a two year term and if uh, if people don't like what they're doing then they get voted out so um, in that in that regard we are accountable also liable uh, perhaps in uh, for, for things that we might say in meetings or things that we might um, we might pursue I mean you have to be careful what you do um, <clears throat> very good thank you. Oh. Very good, thank you. Okay. Um, Gary? Okay. Well, my platform is very clear. I'm for limited government, fewer regulations, and less spending, and being interactive with our citizens. Uh, as far as the Tenth Amendment, which is the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people, and I support that 100 percent. Uh, eminent domain, uh, I do not agree with. Uh, I think that is a big government uh, stepping on its people. And uh, when they were talking about the Trans-Texas Corridor coming through Van Alstine, I didn't want to be sitting on the edge of that thing. And it would have taken some of our, uh, our town. So I am against eminent domain. I uh, think our government needs to be limited. And like I said, I oppose all these restrictions that are put on the people. I remember whenever I got here, everyone was friendly. And if there was a noise, you know, if your neighbor was noisy or playing the music too loud, you'd go over and say, hey, I'm trying to sleep or I'm not feeling well. Can you turn the music down? And they did. We didn't have to have the police go. That You didn't have to call the police and have them go there and threaten and I don't approve of all this threatening that uh, and you know the ordinances we pass ordinances and don't put teeth in it no way to, to uh, prosecute anyhow as with the noise ordinance we needed a decibel level well we didn't get it and the police don't have decibel meters so how do you uh, prove that there is excess sound so um, I that is my platform. Okay, thank you. Jim, I guess you're just gonna go uh, this way. Okay. Um, Karen and I have, have talked previously and we, we agree that small government, less controls. We have ordinances for everything that we have, we, we passed a tree trimming ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> Never got enforced. We passed an ordinance for dilapidated buildings, even budgeted money for it. We haven't done anything about that. If, if you're not going to do it, then don't do it. That it, It's pretty simple on that. Annexation, um, I tell my team of advisors over at City Drug that I'm just going <laughs> to, if I'm elected, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a, a spin wheel with an arrow, and we're going to have north, south, east, and west, and we're going to spin that, and that's who we're going to annex first, whether they like it or not. Um, so, which is a joke. <laughs> team of advisors didn't like that theory. We, we will at some point in the future annex the 75 miles that we have in our ETJ. I mean that 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 will happen. That will that will it is inevitable that it will happen. There will be a day that we will not be Mayberry anymore. We will be just like Plano. 
the Frisco, all of those towns are not being managed by and controlled by the five or six generation people that started those towns. It, it, it's inevitable that, that the new people are going to move in. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. I just want to try to hold on to the Mayberry theory. Uh, Mr. Jaska, even though you're not running against anyone other than yourself, uh, right. what is your platform? Uh, my platform has always been less government control. Uh, as it applies to this town, I think that uh, we discussed it earlier as far as uh, providing incentives uh, to bring people in. That That is, there's too much control there that's stopping those opportunities. Uh, that's what I think needs to be changed there. I agree 100% that if an ordinance is passed and it's not enforced, why are we passing it? That's right. You know, I mean, you know, those those things, you know, if, it, if, it, if it's from a compliance standpoint and we have to do it, then, you know, comply with it. But if it's not, if it's not going to be enforced, I don't, I don't see, I don't see the point. Uh, as far as the uh, annexation and, and eminent domain, we've got to have a strong infrastructure to be able to annex anything. That's right. So that's what our focus needs to be right now, is taking care of what we've got, and when we're able to begin the annexation, the eminent domain thing, you know, it's fine to argue that, but over in Anna, 455 cut through there, eminent domain took half of our parking lot, mm -hmm. our branches parking lot there. there. And there was nothing we could do to stop it. We appealed the value that they were condemning that was going to become part of 455 there. But it was going to happen. It's going to happen. So you can fight it to a certain extent, but there's, you know, there's some give and take there. Um, as far as uh, standards for the council, yes, we're all accountable. We're all on the hook for everything that's done. And, uh, you know, we've got to make our decisions wisely and with our best judgment. And we do need 100% of the facts available to us to make the right decisions. Thanks, Robert. Yes, um, I'm a strong fiscal conservative. I feel like the use of any debt has to be extremely prudent. I'm very concerned about uh, getting the city into a position that uh, our nation is in currently where you are looking at um, almost an impossible situation to ever, ever unbury yourself out of. I think that's just completely irresponsible. I would hope that we never go there. Um, as far as eminent domain goes, I am not a fan of it. If it's an absolute um, impossible situation that has to, uh, where eminent domain has to apply, such as we're talking about Anna, <coughs> then there's not going to be a lot of choice. But um, I am not a fan of it, and we fight to keep individuals' property their property. Uh, the, as far as the um, standards for council, when the city council makes a decision as a council, they are held accountable for that decision as a council. And I think that's very critical because you elect individuals to represent you. And so the individuals that make decisions on the council, whether they've all voted for it or not, the decision of the council is an accountable uh, situation. What you, we want to be doing, though, as individual members of the council, and I think this is already happening, is to stay in touch with uh, citizens so that the decisions that are made on the council were literally accountable to you. Because ultimately, this is not all about money, even though that you know, sounds like it is. It's about our citizens, about quality of life in Van Holstein. It's about what we want this city to eventually become. And we need to all work together to make this an absolutely wonderful place to live. Thank you. This went a lot better than I anticipated. And I'm, I'm gray now. And I'm glad we don't look like Jim, though. I guess that's, that's a good thing.
<laughs> yeah. And I apologize, but apparently the room was a little cold for some of you. I could not adjust the, the thermostat. Yeah. Right. Jeremy, did I adjust? Thank you all for coming. We're not going to go.